martial arts does not manifest itself in a real sudden street fight where emotions are you know, running around, where your brain is worrying about the legal or the ethical or the moral and you're trying to defuse it and stuff just, stuff just erupts. Hello, everyone. It's episode 108 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. Tony Blauer. Before we go any further, I want to let you know that there are two parts to this episode and two versions. Mr. Blauer was kind enough to give us more than two hours of his time, and in order to make that easier for everyone to manage, we've split that into two parts. This is part one. Mr. Blauer is a candid and passionate speaker, and some of his language can be a bit rough at times. Censorship isn't something we like to do on Martial Arts Radio, but we felt it was important to both bring you this episode in the uncut form, but also give you the option of a clean version. This is the uncut version, and you can find the clean one at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best martial arts podcast. I'd like to welcome you personally, I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm Whistlekick's founder, but I'm also blessed to be your host for Martial Arts Radio. Thank you to the returning listeners, and hello and welcome to those of you listening for the first time. If you're new to the show, or you're just not familiar with what we make, check out our sparring boots. No toe strap to slip on, tons of reinforcement to resist ripping, better materials for comfort and durability. In short, a big step forward in the evolution of sparring boots. Check them out on our website or at Amazon. If you want the show notes, including links and photos and a bunch more, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, sign up now. We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. Sometimes we mail out a coupon. And now for the review of the week. This one comes in from Wed Twaffle, (laughs) and it's titled Inspiration in Every Episode, and it's another five-star review. I began my journey to a black belt in Taekwondo on November 2nd, 2012. It has given me so many benefits, from stress management to confidence and so much more. Taekwondo has changed my life forever. The more I train, the more knowledge I gain, and the more I seek to learn about martial arts. As a fan of podcasting, I did a search for martial arts themed shows. I came across this podcast just after episode three was released, and I've been hooked ever since. Each episode is so inspirational to me. When I'm not training, I'm listening to this podcast. I find so much similarity between myself and many of the guests, helping me feel like I am part of a big family, united by our love for martial arts. I thank you for providing us with these stories, helping us remember that the martial arts journey is not without its struggles, but the training we acquired through our journey builds our endurance and perseverance, gives us strength, and helps us become a better version of ourselves with each step. Wow. I want to thank you for that. Wed Twaffle, uh, guessing that's some kind of play on your name, but Regardless, thank you so much. We really appreciate those reviews. Personally, they just mean so much to me to hear that the time that I spend talking to guests means that much to you. So as always, go ahead, shoot us a message, and we'll get you your free pack of stuff for leaving us that generous review. For many of you, the name Tony Blauer is one you'll recognize. Maybe it's from his seminars, his spear system, or something else. For the rest of you, You're about to meet a man who has dedicated his life to the martial arts, but in a different way than many. Mr. Blauer has built a reputation for being direct and speaking his mind, and his time on the show is no different. In fact, his entire approach to martial arts and training are just that, direct. We cover a great many things, and in detail at times. You'll never wonder how Mr. Blauer feels about anything we discuss, and you'll be entertained along the way. I will go so far as to say that this episode if you listen to both parts with an open mind, will inspire some changes in the way you look at your life and your training. In short, you'll be a better martial artist, and I don't know if I'd make that claim of any other episode we've had yet, at least not for the majority of listeners. Let's welcome him. Mr. Blauer, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good, man. Looking forward to this. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun, and You know, one of the things that we try to do on the show is bring in different people that have different perspectives. And of course, anyone that knows you and and knows your name knows that you do some things a little differently. You know, you are not the typical traditional karate guy or taekwondo guy. And so that's why we reached out to you because you're going to have a different perspective. and, And I like that. 
So thank you for coming on. My pleasure. You know, it's always uh, a lot of people don't realize, you know, especially since the the trend for so many years has been the, you know, reality based self-defense and, you know, since the UFC hit and, and all the MMA, you know, it's created, it stirred the pot a little bit and, you know, created more separation. But, you know, I've been involved in martial arts since, um, since the early 70s and you know if you include wrestling since the 60s and uh you know it's always been you know i had magazines back from the 60s where people were still you know questioning what's the best art for the street and what's the best art for fighting and what's the best art if these two guys squared off and so that's kind of been uh you know in every kung fu movie does that too so it's in the back of people's heads you know when when you when you practice when you do stuff uh and you know i guess you know we'll end up talking a lot about efficacy and why we do things and why you know we do things a certain way and and uh and anything about you know just just uh you know i'm looking forward to exploring this i don't know if if you've got uh questions from some of your listeners or a typical like theme that comes up but uh not not knowing anything about that i i welcome that like throw that stuff at me because uh because i don't know what i'm going to say and it'll be it'll be cool i think it'll be fun for the listeners sure sure sign up sort of a corollary there between the questions i'm going to ask you and in a street confrontation right you don't know what you're going to get right now probably if anyone knows what i do the spear system startle flinch i may flinch but no one will see it because this is just audio but uh right (laughs) (laughs) i love it so you said you got started in the early seventies. How? What you know? What was your introduction to the martial arts? My introduction to martial arts. Uh, you know, I've got I got a, a neat legacy because of my age. I'm I'm as of this call, I'm fifty six, and uh, which kind of scares me to say because because I remember when I was six, and I remember when I was sixteen, and I remember when I was twenty six, and looking at people in their fifties as old and. <laughs> going wow you know uh what am i going to be doing then and and um but my start was kind of like a a legacy it was being introduced via the green hornet from bruce lee you know and you know that might not be legit for people but but that was real that was like black and white tv and i was glued to the tv uh for for whatever reason um you know, we had uh, the Dick Van Dyke show then and the Honeymooners and I Love Lucy. But when the Green Hornet came on, you know, my my mom would have to call me like three times. I'm calling you. Get up here. You know, it was the 60s. And you listen to your parents back then differently than, than today. But that'll be another interview on, on this pussified, entitled community that we live in now. But But that was really back then. I was like, whoa, what is this? You know, without that wasn't the conversation that I had. I didn't talk like that, but I was transfixed. And um, and I remember for some reason, uh, we had the old Wild Wild West with Robert Conrad back then. And, and he was really into martial arts and, and boxing. And he choreographed. He was a stuntman who became the star of a show because the star got sick or injured one day on the set. And they were all set up and... and um, and they were like, oh my God, you know, like the director was freaking out and, and they grabbed him. He said, I know the guy's lines, I can do it. And he, that's how he got his role. A lot of people don't know that. He was just a stunt man on, on the, uh, like a stunt double um, and got his break that way. But he choreographed all his stuff because he was, uh, you know, a, a, a skilled boxer and into martial arts. And uh, so both those shows, I was like, I've got to learn that. And uh, I didn't know it. Like, again, I didn't, I didn't watch, you know, sometimes you see something in the news or TV and you go check it out because we have access to the internet and there's so much the ability to, to go shopping now. It's not like, you know, back in the 60s. So there wasn't that, like, connection. I just knew there was something special there. And I remembered that. And I remember talking to my dad because uh, I was getting ready to go to uh, high school. And uh, I, I was just, I don't know why, but I was kind of obsessed with, with, uh, you know, what if I get beaten up in school? And, you know, I'd heard about that. You know, I, was, I remember I, I make a joke now when I talk at, at certain types of conferences or seminars 
and talking about situational awareness and fear management. And, and I go, you know, back in my day, the scariest guy in school was somebody you never saw fight, but somebody said he heard he had kicked somebody in the balls. You know, like just the, <laughs> like, like back then, that was the scariest thing you could imagine in, in the late 60s, early 70s. And, and you look at the stuff that goes on in schools now, and it's horrifying. You know, from the bullying and the gang fights to people with weapons and and stuff like that. But just it's, it's the juxtaposition in my mind is insane. Um, but anyways, that's that's really how it started. Uh, you know, I, I said to my dad, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of want to learn a little bit more about being able to defend myself because I'm going to be in high school and you know I heard there's gangs and stuff and just whatever whatever you imagined as a 12 year old, right? And and he said to me. Well, you know, you know, the best thing is to, uh, you know, learn some sort of martial art. And it was just around the, um, the Bruce Lee craze, uh, 1973. And, um, I just turned 13 and a Taekwondo school opened up a few miles from my house and it was the only place you could go to. And so I signed up there and fell in love with it. And, uh, of course, there was you know a long, long journey, but the as they say, the rest is history. I mean, that's that's it started in the '60s in in the same way people watch stuff on. So my online, <laughs> I was the first online thing, right? I had TV and I was just watching these fights, and then uh, and then went and started and and uh, started pursuing other stuff after that. But uh, that's really where it kicked off. All right. So the the Tony Blower that so many of us know as you know doing doing some pretty div- diverse and uh, to some radical things started as a Taekwondo guy. Yeah. Um, and you know, had there been a boxing gym, you know, 10 feet closer, maybe I'd have gone there and had there been a jujitsu place 10 feet closer, maybe I'd have gone there. Right. It was, it was really, okay, where am I going to go? There's okay. There's one place. Let me see. Should I go here? Or, you know, that was the only place I could go. My instructor was cool. Um, I, you know, I enjoyed the stuff. I, uh, uh, I was, I was, pretty good. I, you know, and, but I worked out like literally seven days a week. I would roll out of bed. Uh, and before, before I actually got to the bathroom to brush my teeth, I had already, you know, cranked out, uh, 50 to a hundred pushups, handstand pushups, smashed a little Macuora little thing for my knuckles that I had under my bed. And, you know, I'd walk down the hallway, you know, throwing kicks towards the bathroom. And I mean, I was a complete fanatic, you know, turned our, our, uh, basement into a little, um, uh, into a little gym. In fact, my, uh, my, um, my dad passed away last year and, uh, my sisters were cleaning out some stuff and sent me some old pictures and some of them I actually just posted them up on my website, you know, like pictures of me as a, you know, 14 year old, you know, working with nunchucks in the, you know, with pictures of Bruce Lee posters and bag and like my whole basement. I was, I was like completely immersed in it, you know? Um, and, uh, when I was 13, like I'd started, maybe I'd been doing it for six, seven months and I was completely obsessed. Uh, and when I was 13, 14, my mom said to me, you know, what are you going to do when you're older? And I was on the floor looking at some Bruce Lee magazine, stretching and, and I just looked at her without hesitation and said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a, um, a famous martial artist, mom, just like Bruce Lee. I'm going to develop my own self-defense system. And she patted me on the head and said, okay, son, we'll talk about this when you're a bit older. You know, and uh, it was funny. It was just, that's all I wanted to do. That's all I thought about. Wow. So the seeds were really planted that early. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, I um, it's one of those things. I mean, I don't, you know, I, uh, it's, 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 it's not obnoxious to say it yourself, but it's, it's, it's like when, when somebody, um, uh, picks a guitar and they know they're, that they're going to be a musician, you know, it's, it's, I just, I just knew when I started doing this, I could see things differently. I questioned stuff. I mean, you know, when we started learning how to, um, you know, you'd have to key eye and then throw your punch at the end of a kata, right? And and as a you know, fourteen year old, I'd go, "Why am I yelling before I'm punching? Won't that alert the bad guy that I'm about to do something?" And and why would I why would I scream key eye and then you know throw and throw the punch? And you know that became like part of my my martial arts stand up routine, where 
separating what I call the categories now. I got these four categories, uh, traditional martial arts, combat sports, reality-based self-defense, and then category four is violent encounters. And my focus was always self-defense, which was my, you know, which is what got me into this stuff in the beginning. So I just assumed that anything that anybody taught me was street ready and street practical, right? So I go, why are we doing this? That's weird. Why would, you know, but it was, it was, and it wasn't like grandiose. I, I didn't go, oh, look how much smarter I am. I'm 14. And, you know, my instructor could, could kick the shit out of me, right? He was, he was amazing. Um, but I would, I would question so many of the things that people would do. Um, you know, at, at, at the age of 15, uh, I was able to, you know, intercept so many things because I would, I could see the setup that what we call in, in our defensive tactics, law enforcement training, the pre-contact indicator. You remember like when you're, um, you're wearing gi pants and you start to sweat when you want to throw a kick, what you always did is, is you'd bounce a couple of times, especially if you're a Taekwondo player, uh, and, and you would grab your, um, your gi pants around mid thigh and you'd yank them up a little bit just to, just to kind of distant, disconnect the sweat from your knees, right? You, you're yeah. visualizing that? So yep. everybody does that. And we bounce around and we kick and spar. But I realized that I did it when I wanted to kick and therefore my opponent was doing it when he wanted to kick. And so I would throw something when somebody went and tugged at their pants. And I would always catch them with a side kick or a round kick or a back fist. And nobody could understand like why I was so fast. And it wasn't that I was so fast. I was sooner. I was, I was moving before you could reset. But I, I could see that and understand that. And, you know, now I teach people how to do that. I teach what that formula is for whether it's a haymaker or somebody trying to hit you with a baseball bat or somebody moving down the street. And, 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 and you know, we call that this, this it's a whole, uh, and I think you were exposed to that stimulus, stimulus, stimulus response model. What happens before? What happens before I got to do this move that I practiced? And, and if you can get to the left of the ambush in your mind, the, 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 the brain-based learning model, and so we use neuroscience and, and neurophysiology to quantify, measure, and explain how we train. And it's why we're able to hack self-defense. We can't hack skill because you can't shortcut experience, right? I can't, I can't, there's no fast way to stamina or endurance or strength, um, you know, you can't, there's no fast way to have 10 fights under your belt. You've got to do 10 fights, right? But there is a way to hack self-defense um, by understanding the categories and understanding how the brain actually learns. And so the concept here is that if, if we can improve our perception speed, we can decrease our reaction time. And so that was the whole thing is if I had a, a back fist in my, in my toolbox, if I had to wait to throw it like Olympic fencing, you go, I go, you go, right? And then we'd go back and forth. And so this would be this, this, you know, what, what, what was lovingly and poetically referred to as the deadly dance, right? When, when we talk about old school martial arts and, and, you know, that deadly dance and, um, uh, but that was truly a dance. What I was looking at was, and it was kind of like intuitive to me. I didn't know I was doing it. And it was this hacking. How do I get, how do I get here sooner? And I need people to understand that when I use the term hacking, it's not like the illegal hacker breaking into, you know, somebody's computer and, and putting in a virus. I'm, I'm using it in the, in the term. I'm not looking also, I want to qualify this and going, we're not doing shortcuts to avoid the work. We're doing, we're talking about how do we, how do we create a shortcut to create a result? And I think there's a, there's a kind of integrity distinction there that I just wanted to point out. Absolutely. The, I, I'm, I'm an old IT guy, and the actual, the original definition of hacker was to break something down so you could understand it oh, on a different level. Yeah. So I think it actually yeah. correlates really yeah, well yeah. with what you're saying. And I'd never heard that explanation for it. I mean, it's got a, you know, a negative connotation in the, uh, Absolutely. You know, in, in, the, in the general public. So, um, cool. Um, yeah, so it was... Uh, uh, it was, I mean, it was a fascinating time. Um, and, uh, but I loved it. I mean, the whole journey, the journey was great. Uh, you know, I got into boxing, um, uh, and, uh, um, when I was 
I got into a fight in high school where um, the the range was really interesting because uh, it was it was a confrontation that I had participated in as just a you know fifteen year old with a few friends uh, and we were kind of bugging some other kids and they were bugging us it was really consensual and then it got it started to get a little crazy and um, uh, w- this guy kind of a, the guy that was kind of the, the 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 target of some of the and let's call it bullying at the time and I was more one of those you know geeky guys standing there like laughing instead of breaking up but it was 1975 and and shit like that happened in school and still does to this day but you know it was it was meant to be more innocent back then and uh some shoving started happening and and this guy lance got upset and and uh uh shoved one of my friends and then he ran out and i was laughing and he and he came towards me and i hadn't i hadn't done anything i hadn't touched him or anything just i was just one of the guys laughing and um he shoved me and my hands came up in what we now lovingly refer to as the nonviolent posture, right? And, uh, and it was just that, that instinctive position. And my, he shoved me back towards a wall. The teacher had gone out of the classroom, which is why this ensued and was able to happen. And, um, and everyone else who had provoked this whole thing kind of scattered. So I was left there. And and he was in the proverbial sense of like mistaking my kindness for weakness. And I say that not to be cavalier, but I was in a, you know, my hands were up going, hey, calm down, man, take it easy. You know, we were just joking around. And, um, but these other kids had pushed him over the top and he was looking for a fight now. And at that moment there, I was like, oh, wow. You know, I, I kind of felt like maybe I'm about to get in a fight. And I'm 15 and, you know, your testosterone is going and, you know, you know, like uh, no one's got any guns or knives. This isn't a gang fight, right? This isn't like like a 2015 or 16 fight. This is 1975, and uh, and I'm like, okay, I'm like thinking, here we go. And then I heard my instructor from my Taekwondo school, his voice in my head, and and he said, really loud and clear, if I catch any of you. Let me preface this by saying I loved martial arts. I loved going to the dojo. I loved, you know, helping clean up and learning the stuff and the, all the, you know, I mean, I was just so into it. And my instructor used to tell us on a regular basis that if I catch any of you using any martial arts as a bully, getting in fights, you're out of the school. No questions asked. If you need to defend yourself, that's okay. But if you're abusing this, you're out. And I realized, wow, this was great. I mean, I wasn't like, I hadn't fought, I hadn't done anything, I hadn't touched the kid, but here I was joking around. And, and I'm building up this drama because at this moment where there was almost this thing of where, you know, like the two guys, oh yeah, yeah, you know, and you shove each other. And then it's like, who's gonna go first that moment? And we're standing just, you know, with our arms reached from each other. And, um, and I hear my instructor say this and I immediately go, dude, I can't fight you. I'm not fighting you. I'm sorry about what happened. Let's just, you know, I'm apologizing. And he looked at me and I could just see he was getting angry. And he was again, that, 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 uh, interpretation of uh, Tony must be scared. And that's why, and and he, he got even more like brazen and he shoved me and, uh, and I'm still pleading with him. I'm pushing away, you know, my hands are, are patting the air, you know, the outside 90 finger splayed. Now I have no idea what outside 90s, finger splayed is and you do because you did the training with us uh but and i tell this story because often when you know when i look back at everything that happened there i'm in this nonviolent posture uh body language is 60 percent of communication i'm trying to diffuse it which is the moral and ethical thing to do and the legal thing to do and sometimes you're inside a, a confrontation where nothing nothing can be done it's on and um, this guy says to me, you know, come on, you're a pussy, and he's trying to provoke. And I, and I said, Lance, I'm not fighting you no matter what. I'm not fighting you. And uh, I could see the, his carotid, the veins in his neck actually, you know, um, expanding. I mean, he was getting ready to sucker punch me. And uh, he goes, come on, you, you know, you freaking chicken. You know, I'll, you know, I'll let you have the first punch. And as he says the word, now I've tried now for like a minute. I've tried to diffuse it three or four times and I realize 
he's going to sucker punch me. I just knew it. And when he said, I'll let you have the first punch, I hit him on the letter U of the word punch. And, uh, and it just flew out there because I knew it was going to happen. And I hit him with a lead jab and visualize that, you know, I'm standing, you know, kind of flat footed with my hands out, you know, fingers splayed, talk, trying to talk him down. And I just fired that lead hand and it caught him in the jaw, rocked his head back, but it was just a quick little jab, right? And I wasn't bouncing around dancing, didn't have a lot behind it. His head rocked back and he came right back with that big, you know, John Wayne sucker punch. And I went, my hands came up and covered my head and pushed away the danger. And you know this, and anybody, if people are a little bit familiar with the spear and the startle flinch, that was the first time I did the protective spear. Now, I had no idea. There was no spear acronym back then. I didn't know what the startle flinch, crossed extensive reflex was or any of that stuff. This was just instinctive, intuitive, you know, physics and physiology working together. My hand shot out towards the threat. It deflected his arm, you know, uh, careened off my forearm. It bounced around me, and we got... We got stuck in the inside really sloppy clinch because his arms, that punch turned into kind of like that shitty inside clinch. And I had wrestled for years before that, before I'd started Taekwondo. And we, I bumped off of him and I immediately grabbed him by the, by the hair and the head, like in a headlock. I transitioned, scooped his neck, grabbed his tricep and did a wicked hip throw just from wrestling, just, just tossed him. He went down hard landed between my feet. At that point, he was sitting right there. And you remember some of our performance psychology, we talked about CWCT, closest weapon, closest target. So I didn't dance to another position. I didn't let him get up. I, he, he landed like right square in front of me with his back to me. I grabbed him um, by the one hand under his jaw, one hand on the crown of his head. And I grabbed him by the head and I threw him into two desks. And I kind of lost my shit at that point. He went careening into these two desks and was like completely winded because he got you know hit by the furniture and he's lying on the ground and at that point i was kind of like in a in a nice side stance looking down at him and i screamed at him if you get up i'll kill you right and obviously i didn't mean that it just blurted out but <clears throat> this happened so fast in slow motion and uh total adrenaline dump after, but I realized years later thinking about that, that, you know, that was the first evidence that, you know, what we practice in martial arts does not manifest itself in a real, in a, in a real sudden street fight where emotions are, 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 you know, running around where your brain is worrying about the legal or the ethical or the moral and you're, you're, tr you're trying to diffuse it and stuff just, stuff just erupts because, you know, when it was, when it was happening, part of my, part of my thought process was at the range, he was like in that poking in your face range, you know, come on, man, let's go, you know, poking you in the chest type range. And I remember thinking he's too close to kick. He's too close to kick because my, my martial bias and preference was Taekwondo. And, um, it was after, it was after that, um, that fight that I actually started boxing. Cause I realized that, you know, Taekwondo didn't, didn't really offer much in the way of at back then, uh, you know, uh, hand striking arsenal where, but everything that happened there was all startle flinch, push away danger, closest weapon, closest target, improvise this. And, uh, it, it's interesting to look back on that and see, what I, when I'm explaining that the hack of self-defense is I tell people, your body already knows how to move, that it's got these, these survival reflexes that, uh, have kept our ancestors alive for years, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of years. And, and my favorite line that I've been using for the last couple of years on, on these interviews, because when everyone asks the question, like, Hey, what's the best martial art? for the street, I always answer artists for a museum, you know, and I'm trying to figure out a way to monetize my haters because every time I say that, <laughs> every time they say that, they're like, it's okay, I hate Blauer. You know, I go artist for museum. The litmus test is um, what you see on Google, what you see on the news, or what you see on smartphones, what you see on body cams, on CCTV. When you're watching real people fight, you, I'm sorry, but you mostly... 99.9% .9 of the time do not see any technical 
combatives, martial arts, even in trained hunters, people who willingly move towards the danger. And um, I think that's something that everyone should kind of think about and introspect and scratch their head. And, and, you know, let me, again, the caveat and qualification is that I'm not saying that you shouldn't do MMA or jiu-jitsu or taekwondo or, or karate. I'm just saying that, you know, if, if you one day said, I need a weapon for home defense, um, something that I know has stood the test of it, you're not going to get a catapult like from a, an old <laughs> castle, right? You're not going to get a black powder gun just because it was historic. Right, you're not gonna you're not gonna get a, a, a mace, and yeah, it would work. But if you really were thinking about the zombie apocalypse and you wanted a weapon, you would. And I'm, you know, this is just a metaphor for the gun haters. You'd you'd want a Glock and and an AR, right? You know, something that you can get dirty and and wet and and you know, I haven't, you know, I have a gun collection. You know, my main Glock, I don't even know that I've cleaned it yet since I bought it. And it's got five, six, seven thousand rounds through it. And I'm just doing this as a just as a as a test, just to see when's it gonna start jamming. Right? You know, so but that's what I want. I want something that I could just grab and use. Uh and it, and the metaphor there is like God forbid I gotta defend myself or my family. I don't want it to be something that's complex motor skill or technical or I need the universe to unfold on my behalf so that I can use this favorite move. I need something that's that's uh that's just right there. I can grab it and it's going to, and it's going to work. And then therefore it needs to be primal and it needs to be gross motor. And it needs to be something that I believe is uh, hardwired in every one of us. And, and, and that's why I've, I created last year to help people understand this are these categories to think about in the same way you would maybe put, uh, weapons in categories and, and, uh, you know, trauma kit in categories, you know, like, you know, do, do I need uh, a, a tourniquet at home or do I need a bandaid or should I have both and understanding what category of danger you, you would, you know, you would have to be experiencing to use what, and then do you know how to use that? So, you know, just to repeat again is like the categories, category one are all martial arts. And, and, and those are mostly, uh, and you got to understand for everyone listening, uh, that the martial arts was very much a consensual practice. Even even samurai, you know, if you look at at uh, um, you know all the all the the lore and stories around samurai, and if two samurai ended up you know killing each other, they were representing you know each other's shogun, and, and but it was a very ritualized tea ceremony agreed to fight at a certain time. It was like a duel, like it was the, you know, old West duels. Uh, people don't fight like that anymore. And so, you know, if it was, you know, like it was taboo to throw your sword, right? You know, so, uh, but, and this is the thing that I go, that I tell people, you know, if, if part of your practice is pure self-defense, so you could protect yourself or your family, you may need to look outside your martial art. Not and I may as me being PC right there. You need to, you know, th are are there attributes that you're going to develop um, from your training? Absolutely. Is it a waste of time? Of course not. You know, it, it's it's amazing. But that's like you know. So I'm very big into CrossFit for a lot of a lot of reasons. Um, in terms of the connection to self defense, is every every CrossFit workout, the wads workout of the day, has a part in it where you want to quit because the magic sauce in CrossFit is the intensity. So CrossFit are like a lot of people like, um, just to go off on a little tangent and bring it back here. My, Please. my, my passion for the, for CrossFit was that, that the adaptation occurred psychologically. So my, my buddy founder of CrossFit, Greg Glassman said the greatest adaptation of CrossFit is occurs between the years. And he's talking about, you know, what happens with learning about you. What workouts do you avoid? What movements do you avoid? Um, when something is scary or tough, you know, how hard do you push? Did you quit? Did you keep going? And if you keep doing that, what you become a better version of yourself each time. And that was my connection to it. So I, every time I do it, it's making me more mentally tough for what I'm all about in my life. And this is, it's teaching personal safety. And so that's, there were, you know, there was, to me, there was a parallel 
uh, uh, relationship in the workout. You know, I could do hot yoga and long distance running for fitness and, you know, TRX and, and any, anything, but there's something very violent about the CrossFit workout that resonated with me. And it's, it's not for everybody, but I understood why I was doing it and why I recommend it to the law enforcement. And remember this also, anybody, if, for listeners who don't know uh, who we are, my students are cops and military. I teach their company. We go trainers all over the world and we do stuff with, with every, with every category. Uh, we're probably the only, one of the few companies uh, that have worked at a high level with uh, uh, like governments to law enforcement, the local state uh, and federal level, um, the Department of Defense's various companies, but also with with women's shelters and mixed martial artists of, you know, from BJ Penn to Frank Mir to Joe Lozon to, you know, like, not like, you know, the guy down the street and not putting the guy down the street might be the next world champion. I'm just saying that we've done stuff over a 30 year career at the tier one levels and in each one of those and also, you know, traditional classical martial artists, the ones that have an open mind to our stuff. And we've got some very, very high ranking uh, martial artists uh, in Europe, in the States who are like way up there, like travel the world teaching Taekwondo and their martial arts and stuff who are doing their best to integrate the spear research into that to make those audiences safer. Because as you know, um, the martial arts can be uh, 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 metaphorically like religion. Some people get a little myopic and a little protective mm-hmm. Uh, about that. And, you know, years ago I wrote that, you know, that, and I always remind people that, that when it comes to your personal safety and your family's safety, there cannot be any ego or politics. This has to be about practicality. And, uh, uh, you know, we come back to the the question of, of why, you know, people ask me, what's the best martial art for the street? I would say, no, no art is for a museum. Street is completely different. You need to reverse engineer your approach. You need to look at how the bad guys are attacking people to understand how you must prepare for that. And, and, and so about two years ago, um, when I got asked the question for the thousandth time in an interview, I said, how did people fight before martial arts? And there was this like really funny pregnant pause there. I go, because like, was the world peaceful? And then martial arts were invented and people started fighting because like, there's people like that are fatalists and causal, like, oh no, I don't want to learn. Yeah. You, you probably bumped into people who go, I don't want to learn some, uh, martial arts because then I'll attract violence. Have you heard that shit? Right. Yes. Right. I'm like, I'm like, really? Oh my God. So what do you even think about? What do you do? You know? So, um, so, uh, Forget those people, but I go like, like the world was always violent, whether it was, you know, and you think about that pain is the mother of invention. So mother nature is violent. And so what happened, right? So our ancestors, like, you know, modern man, like around 80,000 years ago when, and I I used the 80,000 mark because there's, I mean, there's evidence of weapons being developed and used to the oldest spear um, and it might've been just a, like a, a sharp rock that everyone's mistaking, but, but there's evidence of like man-made stabbing, like spearing and paling tools, uh, two, 300,000 years old. And the oldest yeah. one is 400,000. Um, but the evidence of, of, of modern man starting to migrate, move around the world is around 80,000 years ago. And so, so I, my, my theory, and I know nothing about any of this anthropology and archaeology, you know, I know nothing. So this is just the, the, I'm using the same intuitiveness of that. I used to develop the spear system saying, I'm going to assume that, that until people started roaming the planet, that the colonies and communities were fairly peaceful because it was just you and your tribe. Right. You know, and that's probably not true because if, you know, you look at husbands and wives and bullies and, and what have you, but let's just pretend they were for the purpose of this cartoony visual that when people started, you know, moving around the globe and they didn't recognize each other, that's when all the misunderstandings, right? That's where, you know, I make the joke that, you know, communication is the, you know, usually the, the 
first and greatest cause of most wars on the planet, right? Lack of communication. Right. And so, yeah. so play with this little visual. So modern man, 80,000 years ago, starts exploring the globe. And I'm thinking that's when fighting started. But, but there wasn't at the time, you know, uh, like, you know, you come out of your, your, uh, your cave and you and I are going to go eat. We're cavemen. And I go, hey, Jeremy, check this out. A caveman kung fu studio opened up over there. And I go, let's go study there. I go, no, no, look over there. There's caveman combatives over here. I'm going there. And you know what I'm saying? It's like, that wouldn't exist. People figured out how to handle violence. And, and my explanation, if, if you'll humor me and listen to this, is, is that uh, when Mother Nature got violent, modern man and their brain and their you know in, ingenuity figured out how to build shelter and how to protect and how to predict and how to anticipate the stuff right otherwise we'd have all been wiped out um and then when people went out hunting and you know four people went out and three people came back as a giant wolf or a saber-toothed tiger or a bear ate somebody because they were looking for uh, um uh whatchamacallit uh grains and wheat and berries and didn't have any weapons with them modern man figured out you know the first to me that like the first weapon was a rock and then somebody went you know when i threw my weapon away like guy who threw that rock at that bear <laughs> once once that rock was gone he was out of ammo and so right. you know so eventually someone figured out that you could keep things away from you with a long pointy stick and then they figured out if we can tie something that's more rigid to the end of it we could do more damage with it and uh there was an interesting thing that we were just reading online about the, the first spear that that there's a, a direct link um with uh um uh, growth and 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 the size of the brain and the skull size and this is the the interpretation when when man started hunting because it started getting protein instead of instead of uh you know just all the carbs um, yeah, but, I've, I've read that myself. Yeah. So, anyways, that's neither here nor there as far as combatives go. But, but maybe. But you know. But the point is, you know, the spear system is both a metaphor and it's actually, you know. And I didn't know all of this when I came up with with spear, um, and and spear being an acronym for spontaneous protection, enabling accelerated response. But the 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 acronym is. Uh, you know, has three aspects to it that make it this this congruent trinity. You know, one is the the shape your arms take when we deploy uh, the converted flinch, right? Is uh, in the shape of a spear, and um, and that's basically really simple to visualize because your arms are attached to your shoulders and your hands are coming, you know, towards the threat, and so they naturally form this this spear point just because that's anatomy and physiology. Um, the fact that we're using the human body's fastest and strongest reflex and movement, the startle flinch response is the fastest response the human body has. And it's this 80,000 year old and older DNA. And then the strongest uh, uh, frame and position from a pure physics point of view is this outside 90 finger splayed and using the extensor chain uh, harmoniously in balancing it from a kinesthetic point of view. And so everything we do is based on the science. And this is, you know, this discovery of mine was, was accidental and it was incidental. I was doing an isolation drill in the eighties, um, called the sucker punch drill. And I was, had one of my students trying to sucker punch me or we videotaping it. And I was just trying to watch what my body was going to do. And, uh, um, I'll get more into that in a second because I want to finish the caveman story. But, but the, I believe like the first spear was developed as a protective mechanism. It wasn't like, oh, let's go hunt. I believe that the the threat from the outside is what created the weapon. It wasn't people weren't like sitting around going, let's go, let's go, you know, kill bears and eat them, right? I think the bears tried to eat the humans first. Um, and uh, but if if you do a little research on the startle flinch cross extensor reflex and what it does is it you know it pushes away danger or it covers up in that fetal position to cover the head and the same movement of of like a crossbow like drawing an arrow that same movement of recoil of and then drive forward that's the movement of the startle flinch but that's also the same um, 
kinematic movement you would use to impale a spear into a threat. And so there's this weird serendipity that I discovered doing all this research on spears and, and, and modern man. And I went, wow, because that wasn't my intention in 1988 when I came up with this. It was, it was, um, it was truly just this experiment where I went, how is it that I've been training now for, let's say, uh, 1988. So I've been, you know, I've been training for, let's, let's say 18 years, you know, doing some sort of force on force stuff. How is it during this, this isolation drill that we lovingly called the sucker punch drill? <clears throat> uh, and you know, we watched, we watched back the videos after how is it that I was getting clocked? I mean, when I finished the drill, Jeremy, I mean, my, I had, a migraine. I had a mouse under each eye. I was bleeding from my mouth. My face was swollen. It wasn't like wax on, wax off, like in the movies. In my student, can you describe that drill? Just yeah, yeah. For, it was, for everybody listening, is there a quick way to do that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so back in the eighties, what was really big? It was the June Reese safety chop era, and Bill Wallace and Joe Lewis and Chuck Norris, and you know, where, I mean, that was the big thing. It was you know, kickboxing and. Um, and so what you did to practice self-defense is you gotten, you sparred and, and that was your idea of doing scenario training. And if you look at the old book, uh, Danny Inosano's old book on G Kundo, where he talked about multiple sailing drills, you'd see like three guys or four guys surrounding one guy and they were all in boxing stances wearing like 16 ounce boxing gloves and they're doing like multiple and they would call it multiple sailing drills. In other words, and this wasn't malicious. This is what, what we just understood back then. Like guys weren't going, I know this isn't the most practical way to train, but let's teach this to our student, right? Like nobody was, it was just where we were at. And, um, uh, so one day, and remember I said, like when I first started talking, uh, I just would see things differently and I always did. And then I would act on it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't shut myself down. It was one thing that was uh, that I was fortunate as part of my psychological makeup is that that you know when I was fifteen and the instructor would say key eye and then punch, I wouldn't do it. I always mouthed it in the class. I refused to do it because I believed that it would it would alert my opponent that I was about to do something, and I knew that I didn't want to do that. So I never developed it as a habit. There was no Pavlovian conditioning for me. But what I would do, because I didn't want to have to do push-ups or run around the gym or, you know, spar, you know, the, the uh, higher belts and get my ass kicked because I wasn't following orders, I would lip sync the key eye, right? But, but in my mind, if somebody said, why, why are you doing it? I had a strategic and tactical explanation for why I thought it was wrong. But how audacious was it, would it be for a 15-year-old to tell a Taekwondo master, I'm not doing that, here's why. <laughs> you know, that would be, <laughs> you, you don't do that. And that's, and to me, that's some of the problems I, I think that, that we should be able to put our hand up in class and say, why? And then the instructor shouldn't say, well, it's because my master told me to, or, you know, I, I would like, you know, I had one of my students come in, actually the, 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 the kid that I developed the sucker punch drill with comes in one day, he's new. And I had this, all this stuff planned to work with him. And, um, and he says, Hey, uh, he was doing privates and he, and he says, uh, he says, Hey coach, um, could we do something? I don't want to do anything physical today. I got some questions for you. And I'm like, yeah, sure, man. And he goes, could we talk about the role emotions plays in fighting? And I'm like, what? He was like this 15 year old kid, right? He had like two lessons. Yeah. I want to talk about the role emotions. And I just like immediately fell in love. You know what I mean? It's like, I was like, holy shit, because that, that is what drew me to everything. I just posted a, a meme yesterday on, on Facebook and Instagram and, and stuff where, where I said, you know, like all the real value of training with us is trying to, is learning to understand how to manage fear because fear throttles everything we do in life. It, 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 it really, it influences who you marry, where you work, how much weight you lift, and most importantly, whether you defend yourself or not. And if you can't manage fear in situations, you are then moved by the current of fear, right? It'll push you into corners and places you probably didn't want to go. And then what happens is homeostasis and adaptation, you find up, and that's the, the proverbial rocking chair test of I should have said this, or, 
you know, I should have, I should have asked her out on that date, that girl from high school, or I should have punched that guy in the face when he, you know, when he, you can't do that anymore. But, but back when, when I grew up, punching people was okay. Um, but that's, <laughs> that'll be another talk. The good old days. Yeah. Um, but the sucker punch drill. So this kid, Warren, he trained with me for years, turned out to be a really good boxer. One day he comes in and I say, Hey, Warren, I want to do something with you. I woke up this morning. I hallucinated this drill. I said, we're always talking about self-defense. And then we do all these drills where we're in the ring and we're doing like kicks and, you know, blocks and strikes and throws and grappling and all this stuff and very eclectic, but, um, it's not the street, man. The street starts off with a scenario and I said, we need to, we need to start looking at that. And he's like, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, you're going to put on boxing gloves. I'm going to put on a mouth guard. I'm not going to hit you. I'm not going to do anything other than try and not get hit. And uh, he says, uh, okay. He says, so let me, let me understand this. I'm just going to hit you. You're not going to hit me. And I go, yeah, that's kind of it. And he kind of like gets this like evil kind of look in his eyes. And I start thinking, I wonder if this is a good idea. And, and uh, quite literally, you know, what I said was, um, I said to him, the only thing I need you to do is I need you to start a scenario. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, I want you to like, you'll walk up to me. And I'm going to suspend reality. If you come up to me and you say, hey, the boss wants his money back, then I'm going to assume that you're a strong man from a loan shark and I borrowed money from the wrong people. If you come up to me and you ask me a question about the weather, even though we're inside, I'm going to look up at the ceiling and pretend I'm looking at the sky. I'm just going to go with it. And then, you know, obviously try to create some sort of dialogue that would provoke some tension so that you know, we can practice some verbal and then you, you're just going to hit me whenever you want. And it was really weird because I had been so acclimated to boxing and kicking range that when he encroached me and he walked in with his hands down, wearing gloves and I had a mouth guard on, when he got inside my arm's reach, my heart started pounding. I got a wicked adrenaline dump. And I actually, the first time he walked up to me to go like nose to nose, like, like a jerk in a bar or road rage situation. I actually pushed him away, you know, and I went, Hey, get out of my, <laughs> and, and I, I had to stop myself and go, Whoa, like, this is weird because what, what we were doing was now introducing distances and dialogue inside a discomfort zone. And again, so this is all this, you know, this might be psycho babble for some people, but this is, this is the secret sauce for understanding self-defense. I still look at this to this day, and this is, you know, 30 years ago. Um, I still look at uh, the way people are teaching self-defense, and I go, oh, my God. You know, like I've written about it. I've shared this stuff in publicly. We've got 40 videos out. There's a lot of information that, that people could use to augment how they do stuff. Because the only way to really learn about personal safety is to do scenarios. Because you need, it's not about the knee or the elbow or the kick. And that's the mistake uh, that is made in category one and category two, and even in, ca in some of category three, where the, the focus in the category one martial arts and the focus in category two combat sports is mostly the physical realm, the execution of technique. I've got a very provocative expression. I tell people that, you know, the, 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 the singular pursuit of technique is is really your greatest hindrance to your spontaneity in the street and it drives people crazy again i don't know how to monetize the haters i wish i could maybe you can help me with that <laughs> but it, but it's, it's because you've got like famous legendary martial art expressions like you know the you know the uh the the uh, ten thousand reps and 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 you know the uh, um, uh, you know self mastery and stuff like that and i think people are misinterpreting stuff and you know a lot of it is just i saw a funny a funny comment on a instagram post yesterday where some well-known tactical magazine was showing a guy uh risk, you know doing a, a a weapon protection he had a pistol in his hand the other guy had a knife and people were going crazy on the guy's underhand grip overhand grip should he be here was the gun in the right position what would have happened and one guy finally just posts guys it's a staged picture in instagram calm down you know, like, you know, it's like everyone's like, going, like, right. as if this was like the holy grail and we had to decode this. And, um, and so, 
you know, this, this, this is the area, like when I say, hey, your pursuit of technique could be your single greatest hindrance to your spontaneity in the street. And what I mean by that is, is like, look at what I said when Warren stepped inside what's called the reactionary gap, when he stepped inside that, that three foot demarcation, right? That, that, that invisible line when as Americans, as North Americans, when we're standing and talking to somebody, like if someone gets a little bit closer, you're, you back off unless you're having a confrontation and then you're, and you're just being a, like a douchebag, you let somebody get that close to you. You know what I'm saying? But in right. sparring, if we were going to box and I moved into close quarter range, you'd step back. You get used to this kind of like magnets of the same polarity. We kind of hover at the distance that we're acclimated to. And you can't, and this is so subtle, Jeremy, but this is, this is the moment where somebody steps too close to you your physiological system gets a fear spike because you're inside of a discomfort zone, therefore outside of your comfort zone. It triggers a fear spike, but you've never talked about fear management. You get this adrenaline dump, you get sweaty palms, you maybe get a little auditory exclusion, a little tunnel vision, because you've never really explored the difference between the psychology of fear and the biology of fear. What ends up happening is your brain does two things. One, cognitive dissonance kicks in right away because it goes, okay, you're cool, you're cool, everything's cool, but you're not cool. And then your other part of your body, your brain starts to identify what are these feelings. And then, and I've interviewed so many people in my uh, 30 plus year career. Most people interpret those feelings as lack of preparedness, lack of understanding. Um, some people escalate it to, I must be a coward, I'm not ready to fight. And they don't understand that this this is just like adrenal dumps and the fear spike and and what what uh, the goofiest name ever from uh, uh, the research community arousal you know the f- fear based arousal you know and and you know I don't like the word because I prefer arousal to take place somewhere else not in a fight so <laughs> right so um, but again just you know this is the nomenclature uh, but people don't people don't study that stuff that's really where we've kind of differentiated ourselves. Uh, I don't know if you know Kenneth Jay, he's a, 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 like a, a researcher from Europe. Um, yeah. big, big, uh, you do know him or you don't? I, I don't, no. Yeah, uh, but he's, he's a big, big man, but he, he, he trains a lot of fighters, but he's, he's a, kind of an aerobic capacity person, does a lot of stuff with the treadmill. And um, I don't know him very well, but like uh, I, I've had uh, lunch with him once and he trained with one of my one of our instructor development courses, I wasn't, I wasn't the lead instructor at it, like maybe 15 years ago. But as a researcher, you know, he's big into the measurements. And, you know, we posted something recently that, that basically we just, we just said flat out that there is nothing we teach that can't be uh, analyzed, quantified, measured from the sciences of psychology, kinesiology, physiology. We won't show you anything in our system. And, and, um, and we'll explain it through those definitions and filters. And, and so there was this, you know, uh, it was, uh, one of the slides from our, our instructor PowerPoint that we posted and, um, uh, and he just, he reposted it and said, this is why I love these guys. And this is why it's one of the only self-defense programs I'll endorse because it's science, you know, and we talk about our three P's is, is everything is based on physiology, physics, and psychology. And so unless you're a unicorn or a, an alien, you know, or, or a mermaid or, or something else, studying what we do will make you safer because it's only about physics, physiology, and psychology. So, right. but anyways, um, and that's what I, and that is what I discovered in the science of a sucker punch drill where I thought, I, I thought it would be um, competence confidence and complex motor skills that would that would get me through the drill and so i thought that when warren would throw something that i could do wax on wax on all day because he was my student even though he'd gotten to be a pretty good boxer good fast twitch muscle fibers and you know we changed stuff up he was firing from an unorthodox position uh, position his hands were down so he wasn't in a boxing stance he was in a new range and so this is category four it's, it's the brain-based learning model of understanding category four, which is violent encounters where someone comes up to me, comes up to me and he's like, Hey man, the boss wants his money. And I'm like, dude, I need a couple extra days. Whack. Uppercut. 
right? Boom, hits me. My head turns into a Pez dispenser. Like he, you know, threw the punch while he's mid sentence. You know, I had a mouth guard on, gloves on, and this went on for almost an hour. Did I block some stuff? Yeah, uh, but I I took more clean shots. But I knew I was onto something. It was I think 1987, 88, and we were filming with one of those old RCA VHS machines. You know, where the pop the side popped open and you just yep. Yep. you know some of your listeners are going VHS. What is? That? I got to Google that. <laughs> um, um, but it was an amazing experience. But I sat down after, you know, just ice pack on my face and Tylenols and going, what the hell was that? And, uh, and that was the birth of the spear system. There was no spear. There was no startle flinch. There was no acronym. It was why every time I flinched, I got hit in the forearm, elbow, tricep, shoulder. I intercepted stuff. But every time I tried to do wax on, wax off, and I use wax on, wax off as tongue in cheek, a block, a parry, a slip. And, and, you know, what I tell people is this, you know, that, that you can't intercept a complex motor skill with another complex motor skill if you allow somebody to start their complex motor skill first. It just doesn't happen. It's physics. It's pure physics, right? It's the SAT exam. Like, you know, two trains leave, one leads, you know, you know, the, you know, you know, the question, a train leaves New York travels 70 miles an hour and, you know, who gets the year first? Um, and you got to, you know, at, at the end of the day, if, if one train is moving way faster, you can figure out some algorithm to figure it out. You know, if they, if they're, if they're traveling the same speed, traveling the same distance and one moves, starts a second earlier, it's not, and that's the action versus action. It's pure physics. And, and so you know, we started in investigating and interpreting that, but there was a lot going on, not just understanding stimulus response and gap time and how your brain needs to make a decision, but also recognizing that we weren't, we weren't doing any patterns. There was a very interesting study done with one of the, uh, uh, like a chess grandmaster, um, who, uh, they did this test with her where, uh, they, they had this van driving by, and on the side of the van was a magnetic chessboard and it had the, the pieces on the chessboard and it would drive, like just drive by her and she was like sitting outside or inside of a coffee shop. So it would just drive by and, and she could replicate where all the pieces were on the board every time it drove by just by like sight glance, all the pieces. And so she's like this savant chess master, right? But then they did something interesting. It was this brain scientist test. And um, they started putting the pieces randomly on the board. And she couldn't remember any of it. Any of it. In other words, when they changed, when, when, they, uh, when they had the traditional setup, the one that we all learn, right, where the rook goes, where the bishop, bishop goes, where the king and the queen go, all, of, all the pawns. Sure. When they had all the pieces in there, she could, she, could, she could replicate the board and show what the next move was and how to, you know, she could start the game. But when they put them randomly, like as if a kid put them on and had no idea where things were supposed to go, it threw her brain completely off and she couldn't remember, she couldn't remember the pieces. She could only remember a couple of them, but it was like going complete, like, like Latin. And it was an amazing study because, do you see where I'm going with this as far as martial I do. Yeah, yeah I do. It's fascinating. It was a, um, uh, I believe it was a National Geographic study. And I just got, I was doing some training with the military down in Australia and they were, they were so fascinated with our brain-based research. One of the guys had seen this and sent it to me and I was like blown away by it because what it does is it's again, a, a, um, like a separate study that just shows how we identify stimuli and, and, and how, you know, if we're so used to being in a boxing mode or an MMA mode or a jiu-jitsu mode, what we do is we predispose ourselves to look for that setup so that we can set up our setup so that we can do the shit we're good to go. We're good to do at. And this is what I meant by when I said uh, that that, and this is kind of a deeper philosophical re-understanding of my statement that that singular pursuit of technique of that mastery could be your greatest hindrance to street spontaneity. Because the bad guy in the street isn't coming at you like a chess board. He's not coming at you from the orthodox position 
with an agreed to stance where you go, oh, I know where this is going. Right. It's, uh, it's pretty deep. So let's talk about what someone that, you know, sees the logic in what you're saying. And, and I think that, you know, we, we may have some people out there that are, might take issue with some of the things you're saying, but for the most part, I'm going to guess that the audience is... I just figured I had to monetize my haters. <laughs> right. <laughs> all my Good. haters, 10% off all my DVDs, email us. Okay, go on. What's the question? There you go. There you go. So for the majority, and, and I'm putting myself in this group, that are hearing what you're saying and saying, yeah, this makes sense. I get it. How do you, how might you merge the two? How do you take some of these concepts that you're talking about and work them, but yet not give up maybe the karate, the taekwondo, the jujitsu that you love, that you've been doing for 10, 20, 30 years? Yeah, it's, it's, you know what? Um, I use a stamp metaphor and I'll, and I'll give you a couple of, a couple of things out there and hopefully my, my passion is making the world safer. When I was 20, I was asked by, by um, a business developer what I wanted to do. And I said, I want to make the world safer. And he looked at me and he said, oh, okay, that's kind of grandiose, don't you think? And I was like, why? You know, and it was like, the, you know, wow, how are you going to do that? I said, I, I, I don't know exactly, but I think we teach self-defense wrong. I think we need to reverse engineer. I think we need to use our, our emotional psychological systems differently and we need to not focus so much on complex motor skills. This is in 1980. Um, and, you know, so here we are. How many years ago was that? 36. Yeah. Holy shit. Um, so, uh, you know, that's still my passion. That's still my passion it is, it, you know, I've, I've got teams around the world helping me do this and, and some people don't get it. So, if, you know, if you, if you put me in, in front of like, you know, a hundred Taekwondo grandmasters I, and who, you know, can kick apples off of katanas and, you know, jump up in the air and, and, you know, split, you know, boards and do like amazing things with their body and lightning fast. And they're all badasses. You don't want to, you don't want to fight them, but you know, one of our, our maxims in our train the trainer course is don't show your students what you can do, show them what they can do. And, and it's huge at the end of the day, uh, unless that person who's that amazing is your bodyguard, you're no closer to being able to protect yourself than you were when you started. And the other thing is there's a, there's a lot of evidence out there. And, a, and I say a lot, there are many examples of very trained people getting messed up big time in real fights because they're not able to read the danger signals because they've never done scenario based training. They just go, well, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be an obvious metaphoric bell when the fight's going to go. And then I'll step back and kick this guy or punch this guy or take him down. And you'll see like, like anytime there's violence, you know, on any one of our posts, someone will go, you know, uh, Krav Maga is the best. And then someone else will post, no, Jiu Jitsu is the best. And, you know, I post, I post stuff where like I'm promoting the CrossFit defense course and a guy like on there going, you know, uh, this is fake. You know, uh, no one's going to attack you at a med ball. Uh, this is bullshit. You got to study jujitsu. And I'm like, Oh my God, you know, it's like 2016 and you still have like the Shaw brothers Kung Fu movie going on on Instagram, you know, or Bruce Lee return of the dragon who can do karate better than the Japanese. You know, it's like, um, and so you know, coming back to your question of, of for some people, there is no blend. It's understanding that I've got this antique gun collection because I collect guns, but my, my home defense weapon is my Glock. Right. And, 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 and I have this collection of these swords and knives, but, uh, you know, I'm going to use a combat tomahawk, tomahawk, as my my bladed weapon in home defense and i'm and i'm actually being literal so i've got right pistols and i've got tomahawks with you know uh you know they're they're badass they're insane what you can do with it and so i look at i look at, okay what if i have a home invasion and i need to fight and grab shit fast you know what i want to be able to do and and what i want to be able to grab i, I want i want 
I imagine there's going to be a ton of fear and a ton of adrenaline. So I want something that is primal and gross motor. That's a hatchet. And then if I can get to my, if I can get to the gun, uh, you know, I want something that, that, you know, is going to work that I trust is going to work. Um, and I've got other so, more high tech, you know, guns that, you know, if I go, if I go, you know, do a competition or something, but the tolerance is on those and things that they get a little bit dirty, you got to jam. Right. So, but what were you going to say? So uh, what I'm hearing is you're, you're advocating, if I can use that strong of a word, a separate component. It's not that reality based, you know, let's stay alive sort of training falls under the heading of traditional martial arts. It's not a piece of my karate class, my taekwondo class. It's a wholly separate thing. It requires a separate attitude, a separate skill set, a separate lesson plan. I I believe that. I, I believe that. It's almost like, uh, you know, Greg Glassman of, of CrossFit notoriety for some, you know, like people I, I can... You know, I've been around him for a decade now. It's actually been 10 years that I've been involved with CrossFit. And where people would say, so, sh you know, can I, have, I have a question. Should I continue uh, doing tennis but also incorporate CrossFit because I'm a professional tennis player? And he'd go, yes. And he'd go, should I do less tennis and more CrossFit or more tennis and less CrossFit? And he'd go, Yes. <laughs> you know, and then someone would go, I'm an MMA guy. Should I do more CrossFit and less? He'd always say yes. In other words, he, what he's saying is you got to find the balance that works for you. And if you do more of something that suddenly you're doing so much CrossFit that you're starting to lose fights, you've, you've, you've gone the wrong way. The pendulum has gone too far. Um, I really believe after 36 years of teaching and watching and interviewing real victims of violence, you got to remember this also. I said it earlier. My students actually fight. I hope I got a whole bunch of more haters there. Um, <laughs> my students are police officers. My, what Blower Tactical does is our main business is training law enforcement and military. So the feedback I get from people is, is them fighting the, the, the meanest pieces of shit out there. You know, I mean, just people who just don't care about your body, your property, your life. And, and I get, I get feedback on what works for in the 3Ds, the verbal, the spear, the closest weapon. All our stuff is performance enhancement based and it's all based on something that our, you know, our criteria is it can't be gender, age, task, or body type specific, right? So if you're an ectomorph or a mesomorph, that's going to change whether you like wrestling or taekwondo at certain levels, right? And what, what you can adapt to faster. And so, so, um, you know, so it, it's, if I say, Hey, this is all based on science and this here and this works and this is the hack. Um, but I'll tell you this, here's another one that will blow people's minds. I can teach almost anybody. And I say almost, I mean, somebody who doesn't have some sort of, uh, f serious physical disability or emotional disability in four to eight hours, you can learn to defend yourself. Now that might seem absurd. I've actually said to high ranking martial artists who have challenged me verbally, in, in, in front of people where I say, Hey, give me a weekend with somebody and they will be able to protect themselves and their family. And I'm not talking about, you know, you know, Oh, I've got this friend who's got like, you know, hitman after him. And you know, he's, uh, you know, go, whoa, whoa, okay. Like, you know, that's, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm exaggerating to make a point that if you've got like trained assassins after you, maybe you need more than a weekend. Um, <laughs> but weekends. yeah. Um, but if, but if you're, um, uh, if you're just a good Samaritan trying to get through life, right? You want to go to your Taekwondo class. You want to go to your Judo class. You want to go to your MMA class. And I'd say that I want to go to ballet. I want to go to my art class. I'm working during the day. I want to come home and see my family. Um, what you need is some fundamentals of situational, excuse me, situational awareness. You need some uh, understand that strategies and tactics for verbal de-escalation. And how to use choice speech and, 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 and how to read body language signs if things are working or not. And then some simple, simple, smart self-defense, some simple stun and run. And you need to know the lines that need to be crossed for you. And they're different. They can be different for each person. 
and, and, and these things will be throttled or influenced by who you are, where you work, uh, you know, literally like, for example, you know, if, if you go to Italy, people stand like, like 18 inches closer than they do in America. Right. So you, you, someone can come right up to you and you're like, um, uh, you know, you, you don't want to shove somebody and go, get out of my face. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you got to understand the culture. And so, yeah. um, but I can, I can, I can, I can do it in, in, in a weekend. I can do it in a day. And the way I explain this is, and we just, we just, uh, uh published, uh, something on Facebook and Instagram about this, that true self-defense, meaning category four violent encounters, uh, most of the stuff can be handled by just understanding D1, D2, detect and avoid, and defuse and deescalate. That most, in most situations, if you're not there, the situation can't happen, so avoidance is paramount. But most people have no idea what to look for, and they also don't have the internal self-awareness, and um, you'll appreciate this as an IT person, they, do, they don't have a directive. They don't have like an internal if-then go-to like DOS command that says, right? And so if you've been training in the physical applications of confrontation management, uh, there's a part of you that wants to get into a fight maybe. You want to test this or see this and, and maybe that's too provocative and you don't want to get into it, but you don't know how to get away from it because you've never practiced that side of stuff. We did drills back in the 80s, Jeremy. Back in the 80s. I was just talking about this this week, which is why I remembered it, where you'd be the person in the middle and you were told you can't do anything. You're going to be surrounded by six people and they're going to shove you and bitch slap you and poke you and call you names. They're going to verbally assault you. This is way before RBSD was even an acronym. And I don't even like RBSD. I, I, I guess I shouldn't say I mock it and make fun of it, but what other type of self-defense should there be? Like why coin reality-based self-defense? You're either training self-defense or you're not, right? right? It's, you know, it's like, guys, today we're going to do unreality-based self-defense. Tomorrow is the reality-based self-defense class. You know, it should never, it should never be an acronym. And I look at the uh, RBSD as a, um, a looser version of Category 1 martial arts. So Category 1, if I can circle back to this, is is the technical martial arts where what you're trying to do is embody, exemplify, and, and replicate um, the style. This is how we kick. This is how we punch. This is where we move. We learn all these katas. We learn all these moves. If you study my Hicks, if you go look Google Tony Blower Hicks Law, you understand that the more choices you have, the slower you are. That's just neuroscience. And so the idea of saying like, hey, my style has like 300 counters to a jab you're going to be slower than somebody that's got one move. So like spear system is Hicks law compliant. And uh, again, provocative, still working on ways to monetize the haters. Understand this. I make that, I say that joke tongue in cheek. I want any good Samaritan to be safer. That's all I want. And, and so the greatest value that training with us is understanding how to manage fear because you get a fear spike when you think you're being followed or you think you're moving towards danger. That's when it starts. And that's the biggest problem our research of victims of violence are is they didn't know how to get, off, get away from moving towards the X, the X being the proverbial kill zone where shit was going to happen, the ambush point. And so the ones that live to tell the tale all say, yeah, I had a bad feeling. I go, well, why didn't, why didn't you move? Well, cognitive dissonance shuts it down, right? You know, your body tries yeah. to correct it. Or you, 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 you didn't want to... Uh, uh, um, create an embarrassing situation or you didn't want it's all there's like so many so many social stigmas that that but a lot of it is just people don't know how to choose safety and that's our big hashtag in our class is just choose safety there's no downside to choosing safety whenever you choose safety you're safer right and so if you choose safety and you misread a pre-contact cue guess what you're still safe right but if you ignore it and you don't follow my guidance, and it turns out to be a problem, you are in a lot more danger than had you chosen safety and the danger was real because you would now be in a 
place where you're further away emotionally, psychologically, physically from the threat because you started to take action. This is what we call the directive, right? Like, you know, you open your computer and, and, you know, a smart computer does some shit for you and we don't have to write the DOS commands, but the human being needs the DOS command. If then go to, if you get a bad feeling, I want you to stop and I want you to move away from it. I want you to assess it. I want you to evaluate it. And if you're late, big deal, right? That's the only downside of, of I, I took a longer route. I didn't go on that date. I, I, uh, I stopped here and I circled back around. I, I didn't go into my apartment because I had a really bad feeling. So I called the superintendent up and he came in with another guy and nothing was there, but I'm safe. That was weird. Let me think about what happened, right? Instead of right. shutting it down. So right. the first big one is D1 and then D2 is the, the de-escalation. And I'm off on some crazy tangent and so, you know, reel me in. But, but the, the notion is like, I want people to still study. I want you to get your, your 10th degree Taekwondo uh, uh, rank. And I want you to open up a school. And I want you to do seminars and all that. But don't confuse the categories. Don't think that when you're sitting in your car and um, uh, you just put your seatbelt on and your uh, air conditioning isn't working or you roll down your window, you know, what's the most, what's the first thing so many people do as soon as they get in their car? Put their seatbelt on. Yeah, and after that, turn the car on. Yep, and then after that, plug in their phone. Yeah, and as soon as you plug in your phone, before you go to your next meeting or you go somewhere, people check their Facebook or check their Instagram or check their, and you may not mm -hmm. do that, but so many people do that, and that's opportunistic bad guys look for. So, um, true story, I'm having dinner with my wife and my daughter one night, and uh, we pulled up in three different cars because we were all out and we went for tacos and it was nighttime and we're in this dark strip mall and everything's closed but this little little restaurant and we all get in the car and I get in my car and, I, and I'm parked furthest to the left and I look to the right and I see the glow of my wife's face and then through the window I see the glow of my daughter's face. And I'm like, oh my God. So I <laughs> shut my engine. And I walk around the back. My wife sees me. I do the, put my finger up to her mouth, like, shh, like, you know, my, my daughter's car three cars over. I walk over to her car, to like, like a cop approaching. She's looking down at her phone and I hammer fist the window and she just about shits and almost drops her phone. And she looks at me like with anger and terror in her eyes. She goes, Jesus, Murphy died. You scared the shit out of me. I said, roll down your window. And she rolls it down and I grab her. And she like recoils and starts pushing me away. And I scream at her. I go, roll up your window. And she's like, what are you doing? I go, roll up your window. And she rolls up her window. So I got to pull my arms out because they're going to like arm lock myself, right? And are you visualizing this? Like, yeah. She's terrified. And yeah, this is so, intense. So I want, I want everybody listening to this going, you're a Taekwondo black belt, female. And you go, man, I'm a Taekwondo black belt. But you got in your car, you put your seatbelt on, you crack the window a little bit. It was a hot, nice night or whatever. And you're looking on your phone. You're texting, you know, your boyfriend, your husband, your kids. I'll be home dinner. I'm just leaving now. I'm headed to a movie. And now out of the dark, the attack happens. You're Taekwondo black belt in a seatbelt in your car. What are you doing? It's, it's irrelevant. The training you're, is irrelevant at that point. You're a black belt in your car in your seatbelt looking at your phone. Your MMA, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, yeah. and, and so we can say, well, listen, like, you know, uh, the MMA guy or the, the, the jiu-jitsu guy or the Aikido guy, he would understand how to use like an elbow break arm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Everything works once. It doesn't work twice. Once I put you in the scenario and startle the shit out of you, you can start to correct it and figure it out and you miss the whole point. The point is that was a violent encounter and where you get attacked first is emotionally, psychologically, your breathing stops. You're now moving anaerobically. You're in a startle flinch mode. You recoil. You're now an 80,000 year old uh, modern man going, yeah, shit, where did that giant wolf come from? And now you're trying to push away danger. And unless you've incorporated that into your training, the conversion is going to happen slower. And that's the magic and science and art of the spear system training. 
separate to this, and you got exposed to this at your seminar, we did cycle behavior in the neural circuitry of fear, is understanding how to anticipate and think and look at this stuff, but also how to manage that, that fear dump. My point being here, and let me, let me finish the story with my daughter, because she was furious with me. Um, I said to you, what would you do if this happened? She goes, dad, you just scared the shit out of me. I go, answer me. What would you do? What if the guy put his arm through the window and, and you rolled it up and he didn't let go or he's cranked and he's hang and he's, and he's stuck in your car. She goes, dad, this is scaring me. I said, I need you to have an imprint of this in your brain. You're my 18 year old daughter. I just did this to you. Anyone else could have people get attacked in parking lots at night, right? And they don't get attacked in the dojo. They don't get attacked in the wrestling mat room. You're not going to see a mugging happen in the octagon, <laughs> right? right. People track and I hope you guys are tracking this. I just want the world to be safer. And so I just want my daughter to be safer. And so it's a, it's a, you know, it was an amazing moment for her. Cause I said, here's what you're going to do. Bad guys don't want to get caught. They don't want to get hurt. They don't want for things to take too long. You just disrupted all of that. And what you're going to do is you're going to use your car as a weapon and you're going to use your car as a mode of transportation. And what you're going to do is you're going to roll up the window on him. If he's pinned in the car, you're going to, and he's trying to grab you, you're going to put the car in, in reverse. You're going to back out. I don't care if you hit cars behind you and you're going to drive to a police station. Do you know where the police stations are around here? If you don't learn, learn where they are. You're going to drive to a police station with this guy hanging out the, the arm. He's going to get his arm out of there and disappear from you. Trust me. And if he doesn't, you know, you're going to help and assist in the uh, citizen's arrest. Here he is. He's pinned to my car. But right. the point is what I did is I, I trained her in something about situational awareness and I trained her in some practical tactics that are not gender, age, mesomorph, ectomorph, you know, specific. They're not martial. They're not complex motor skill. And I said to her, I go, why are you on your phone sitting in the car here? You could be carjacked. The guy could bust your window. Uh, you know, if, if you looked up and the gun was there and he said, don't, don't fucking move or I'll shoot you. Right. I mean, how many people just shit their pants there and open the door? Right. Right. And I said, you get in your car in the parking lot at night, you start driving right away. You scan your surroundings first. If you have a bad feeling when you walk out the door, you go back in and have one of the, one or two of the guys from the restaurant walk you to your car. People want to be heroes. If someone came up to me and said, Hey, could you walk me in a car? I got a bad feeling. The first thing I would do is wonder if it was a setup. So I would, you know, because that shit happens. I, I know people personally know people who've been mugged like that, you know, uh, yeah. where someone goes, help me, help me, help me. And, you know, like, and, and, and go to be the good Samaritan only to get mugged by the accomplice. So like what a horrible world we live in, but you know, you've got to, you got to threat discriminate. And that concludes part one of episode 108. You can find the rest of the episode in part two, which has already been released. I hope to see you back here shortly as we finish up our time with Mr. Blower. Welcome back for part two of episode 108 with Mr. Tony Blower. This is the uncut version. If you'd like the clean version, that's available over on the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I strongly suggest you listen to that part first. No full intro here for part two, so here we go. Is it a setup or not? Last night, ironically, I'm walking with my daughter and out of the blue, I don't know how I didn't drop my phone. I was looking down on my phone, waiting for my daughter. She was taking some pictures. I was looking down on my phone. Next thing you know, there's a lady beside me asking me a question about <coughs> trying to find somebody on Facebook. And that she's not on Facebook and she had this crazy story about this person in a hospital and she looked, she had crazy eyes and, and, um, you know, the first thing I did is, is I kind of evaluated the distance and I scanned her hands and I kind of looked around and kept, a, you know, looking at her eyes and made eye contact with her. And, and, uh, basically because it felt weird, I said, um, I can't help you because I'm kind of in a hurry, but there's a coffee shop right around the corner that I know has internet access and might have some machines if you need to get on and log on. So I gave her like this really quick story where it, it kind of forced her, if she didn't have a story to go with that, right? 
Like it just, it would just be more revealing. And she's like, Oh no, I, you know, I've got a phone that I can get online. I said, well, then you can log in and look through, through that. She said, well, I didn't think, and it, it just, but it was like, this is, this is D2, right? Detect and diffuse. Right. 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 Um, but it's interesting how like, you know, here I am, you know, all these years later, just like last night using the system to, you know, navigate from some weirdness, uh, um, you know, on, on the street. But, uh, the, you know, the story that I don't, I don't know why it popped into my head, but, um, you know, you were asking me, you know, can people, is there a way to infuse martial arts, uh, sorry, spear with traditional martial arts and classical martial arts? Um, there is on the tactical side and there is on the, uh, psychological stuff. So we have, you know, we've got hundreds of trainers around the world who run their own dojos and martial arts schools who, uh, this is kind of a red pill, blue pill matrix metaphor. Once you do the training and you start understanding physiology, kinesiology, physics, you can't not incorporate it, right? You know, you know, Hey, I've got a more efficient way to teach you to move, but actually I'm not going to show it to you. I'm going to show you a more archaic, you know, rigid methodology. Sure. Um, and so what they'll do is they'll like, Hey, maybe they have Friday night self-defense night. And they, you know, and so now they're going over cycle behavior and they're going over ballistic micro fights. And, you know, we also have a program and a, and a, a protocol where we say, hey, spears a bridge to your next move. Um, and we've got some videos out online, you know, with that where, where people can certainly um, check that out and get some ideas. Uh, the conscientious thing to do for if you're a serious professional instructor is, is get, to, get to some of our training and evaluated, or we're more than happy to put you in touch with uh, other people who've, you know, probably been sitting on the fence, like like some of you might after listening to this call. And I'll put you in touch with somebody who doesn't work for me, but who's just part of our that affiliate program. And you can talk to them and ha and ask them. You know, we're so apolitical. We just want your students to be safer. So the, to me, the people are coming to like I study jujitsu. Well, I travel too much to do it at the level that I want. But, you know, after, you know, over 40 years of doing martial arts, uh, I felt like, like I've, that my research, I mean, I'll never stop learning and tweaking and polishing, but this year I realized, man, you know, we've got a program for CrossFit. We've got a program for law enforcement, we've got a program for military. We've got, uh, kid stuff, scenario stuff, multiple, and, you know, we've been around for 30 years. So we're not, we're not going anywhere. We're not a startup. And I went, I, like, the research is done. Now my attention, my focus is training trainers because I can't make the world safer by myself. We've got 168 people on our affiliate team. We've trained thousands of police trainers. That's, that's a non-commercial. They're just, you know, they train their units and agencies and stuff like that. So my focus now is on training my trainers. That gives me a lot more freedom because I'm not on this, like, you know, this, 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 this path of, of, oh my God, you know, what's the next drill for this or what's that? And that opened up some, not so much time because I, you know, I mean, it's just going nonstop all the time. But I said, I'm going to start doing some stuff for myself. Well, I go to jujitsu class. I can separate the street fight from jujitsu, even though in the jujitsu class, they'll say, and here's a good move for the street. And I go, Oh, I don't know that I would do that. Right. But I, I shut my mouth and I'm respectful and mindful. And the and the guys teaching me, I mean, if I was grappling with them, they would they would crush me. They're animals. They're in, they're monsters. And I, yeah. I, I mean that in a, yeah, in a in a pleasant way, right? In <laughs> you know, in the same way, uh, a buddy of mine who uh, um, takes boxing lessons up in L.A. Uh, this the from this pro is just working out with Conor McGregor, and he said he said he said I don't. He said, I wouldn't want to do MMA with the guy because he's got too many skills, but he said he wouldn't last around with me boxing, you know, and, you know, Connor, I'm sure would say something different because Connor does have a, you know, a solid boxing background, but there's a difference between like being a good boxer and being a professional boxer who's, you know, does it, you know, it's just, it's just different. Um, and so it's, it's it's kind of a little bit like that and looking at like MMA where you go, I need to be, I need to be decent at all these things. Like if you look at the average MMA guy, you know, 
He's got to have a solid wrestling, grappling foundation. He's got to, you know, how to strike. He's got to know how to kick. But if you look at individual punches and kicks and movements, so if you ask Dan Gable to look at the wrestling movement of, of the world's best MMA guys, he might look at two and go, those guys are good. Those guys, the other guys, shitty technique, right? But those guys would, would double leg us and suplex us on our head. You, me, you, me, Jeremy, because they're that much better than us with their wrestling, but they're not, they're not Dan Gable wrestling. You know what I mean? And if, and if you looked at a boxer and you said, look at all these boxers in, in, in the UFC, he'd probably look at almost all of them and go, none of them are really good boxers. But they would light up. I'm not insulting these guys. Do you get that? I'm just yeah, saying. It, there, it's a broad skill set. It, there's a lot of different components, and there's only so yeah. much time in the day. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's like CrossFit, right? Constantly varied functional movement performed at high intensity, but you can't be a specialist. You, you can't be a specialist. And, right. and so, um, if someone, so when someone says, I'm Taekwondo, you're a specialist. You need to then ask yourself, you know, is what I'm learning practical in today's age where I don't have like, like an agreed to ceremonial fight, right? In an auditorium and we're fighting to the death and we've got to use each other's styles, right? Is, is it practical? Is boxing practical? And, and here's the thing that, that, that again, myopic listeners will go, Bauer said this, and I've had that. You know, I said this in 1993, I wrote for three magazines after the, I was at the first UFC. And I wrote this line, although they're really fighting, it's not the same as a real fight. It was one of my lines. And it was published in, in three magazines. And um, that got repeated as Tony Blower said the UFC isn't real fighting. Which turned into a conversations with people in the UFC with, Tony said that you're not really fighting. And I had people like like very famous people, very angry with me. Yeah, sure. And I'm going, and when I heard that, I went, no, what the fuck is with the planet? People are selective listeners. That's not what I said. The full paragraph was only cops and military fight no holds barred. They're not wearing a mouth guard. They don't have a cup. There's no rules meeting. They're not fighting in weight classes. They don't know what the bad guy's going to do. That's a no holds barred fight. And so although the guys are really fighting, it's not the same as a real fight. <laughs> that's what I said. Right. You know? And I think that's pretty obvious. I did. But it's not. The I, you know, why are people so confused by it? Why would people still argue if you look at a real fight? And this is the problem is everything works once. It doesn't work twice. So when you see the fight, even if it's a street fight, you go, well, I would have done a guillotine there and I would have stopped him or I would have hit him with an uppercut there or I would have done a, a side kick to the face or I would have done, right? And, and, and so when I say, well, that stuff doesn't work, the litmus test is the CCTV. The litmus test is look at all the thousands of fights that we've seen online and how many times do you go, oh, wow, that was a good back kick in a street fight. Right. 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 Look at that tie kick. Oh, look at, look at that tie clinch into that, you know, and then people will post like, and I, you know, I got to qualify this because, you know, you know, if you, if you gave out my email and said, send Tony your videos to disprove his contention, I'd get videos of, of most of them would be douchebags in consensual fights. Yep. And so yep, I get tagged in a lot of those on Facebook. Yeah. And I, and I get, I get, I don't know if you were on my personal defense group. I got to look up a closed, but open group. Um, so, uh, uh, personal events readiness on Facebook and you can imagine the people I got to boot off there and the people that get in there and uh, where, you know, they'll show some like wicked crab of God demo. And I go, he just threw like 16 punches. The role player didn't move once. He didn't hit him once. Was the guy fast? Yes. Was he violent? Yes. Would I like to fight him? No, he looks really skilled except he didn't hit the role player once and the role player didn't move after the guy's combo counter started. So to me, that's category three, Krav Maga, doing a kata, but the only difference is they're wearing BDUs and a t-shirt yep. because they're not nailing each other, you know, which is why I developed high gear. You know, if you ask me how many times have you headbutted somebody, uh, 
you know, in, in a real fight, I'll go never, but I've done like maybe like 10,001 headbutts with, with gear on and trained it. So, you know, I know what it's like to have four guys jump me because I've, I've, I've had that happen many times in multiple sailing training, but we're not, you know, we're missing, we're, we're falling, we're, we're vi at watching videos and we're going, man, do we look like shit there? Holy, you know, and you start to realize that suddenly violent encounters, nobody looks good in. If you're actually doing the setup from the, um, phase one where we're kind of moving in from like stalking to contact, verbal contact. Hey, what are you doing here? Hey buddy, can you give me directions? What are, it's like, I always make this start when you did the, the CrossFit defense gig with me, was I talking about the Star Trek model at that time? Does that ring a bell? It doesn't ring a bell. Okay. So, so, you know, part of the evolution there is the Star Trek model of self-defense is that the bad guy beams down into position and you start from there. Like when you practice in martial arts, getting out of a headlock, where does the drill start? Starts in the headlock. Right. But in real life, how does somebody get you in a headlock? Was you have to be like, you just finished a workout, so you're bent over, you're huffing and puffing, and then somebody beamed down from another planet in a headlock, right? That doesn't happen. No, there's, so yeah, there, there's some kind of transition that gets to there. Right. But there, and there's, there's, there's a verbal assault, there's a skirmish, there's a, um, uh, you know, there's a, 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 a whole bunch of, um, um, pre-contact cues, but if you eliminate them, uh, if you eliminate them, you don't develop any of the you kind know, of the situational awareness, pre-contact use, how to manage dissonance, how to manage fear. Those, so those D1, D2 is what's left out of category one, category two, and very often category three. And so those are the most important part. That's where you get your shit together in a real fight. Then you go, oh shit, what's this? Well, okay, stay calm, take a deep breath. Okay, verbal tactics, move here, get to the improvised weapon. Where's your escape route? And you start to see all that happening and then you go, oh, it's nothing. They walk by me, right? <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating to make a point, but like the people, the people that don't get away are the ones that are, that get caught off guard. Right. One of my favorite sayings, and, and I, I may have used this on the show before, is you can be underprepared or you can be overprepared. You will never be perfectly prepared and I will always choose to be overprepared. Yeah, I dig that. I have friends ask me, why do you carry a knife on you? Because there is far more likelihood that I will not have a knife and regret not having it than I will have a knife and regret having it. Right. Right. I dig it. I like it. And I think that ties in well to what you're saying. And, and one of the things that kind of popped in my head as we're talking about some of these scenarios and you know you're you're very tuned into some of the skeptics you know i mean you've you've dealt with the skepticism from the traditional martial arts community and honestly this is part of why i wanted to have you on not because i want to give anyone an, an opportunity to to poke at you or anything uh I, I hope it's apparent to everyone that i value what you do and you wouldn't be here if i didn't right and that's not just because you know i had the opportunity to take a seminar with you i've you know, respected your work for quite a few years. And I think you're, you're doing some absolutely amazing things. Thank you. And I don't think, oh, you're, you're welcome. And I don't think anyone has to look any further than their typical martial arts school to see what you're talking about. And, and here's what I mean. Mo anybody that's tra been training for a few years will usually have an experience with a brand new student, first day, second day, third day, where if they work with them, that person comes up with something that is so far beyond what they would have expected, whether it's a sparring drill or, you know, one three-step sparring, and it makes them go, holy crap, what just happened? And it's usually it's not at any kind of high speed, but it because it's so far out of the box of what would be expected, it shows you that there is more to what's going on in what we're training as traditional martial artists typically. And, and it's, it was from a number of experiences I had like that, that I started to look at what else was out there, like the things that you offer. Right. Very cool. The, yeah. the, yeah, listen, you know, um, 
You asked me something interesting about integration before, and I want to just come back to it because, as I understand it, you know, most of your audience, you know, is from the the more classical, traditional, authentic martial arts side, and that's cool. I love the martial arts. I want to make that clear. I'm a fan of it. I'm a, uh, an historian um, in the recreational sense. You know, I love watching old martial art movies and and uh, you know read all the books and, and, and I dig all the stuff, but at the same time, I know what I know and my students really fight. And I know that these people who have tremendous courage who move towards the danger cannot pull off complex motor skills. It's just not happening. Uh, even some very skilled people. And so they can keep their metaphor swords sharp like a lot of the people i train all do jiu-jitsu and mma and, and it keeps them razor sharp but you know when when some guy's grabbing at somebody's gun or throwing a punch or trying to headbutt somebody or bite him in the head this is primal gross motor they're not like you know putting their thumb on the third metacarpal bone and twisting their pinky toward the goldie tendon and driving the you know they're, they're not they're not doing that stuff they're the 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 big bang moment of the fight when when the collision happens is primal gross motor. Then there there is often a more complex motor skill transition, and that's what we mean by spear is a bridge to your next move. And so, for the average person who just wants to uh, live a peaceful life, doing the one day seminar is all they need. If you're a fanatic martial artist and somebody somebody's going to spend 60 to 90 minutes listening to the show is obviously deeper in it than recreational um then you know listen something that i tell people especially the skeptics you know go you can't learn to defend yourself in a day well you can learn you can take a, a an intensive cpr first aid course in four hours and possibly save somebody's life but it doesn't make you a doctor so i'm not saying that you can train for a day with us and you're a doctor or a black belt or you can get an octagon. That's ridiculous. I'm not saying that. I can teach you how to use a fire extinguisher in 15 minutes and you're not a fireman. But that knowledge of understanding how a fire starts, detect a fuse, defend the fire, might save you or your family's life or your property one day. Property, body, life. Those are part of my research formula to make people safer. That's what the bad guy wants. That's what the fire wants. So I can spend an hour with you doing some drills on evacuating the house and where you should put the fire extinguisher. You're not a fireman, but imagine a firefighter coming into the house while I'm teaching your family this and mocking us. Or a doctor walking into a CPR class going, you guys will never be able to do open heart surgery. This is a joke and mocking. And this is the this is the thing that 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 horrifies me online with people where I'm just trying to make people safer. I'm not trying to get no, we're not giving them a black belt in a day. We're not saying you could box or kickbox or or anything else. I'm just saying if if you God forbid your mom or your daughter, your sister, your friend, your best friend, your aunt was about to be attacked, but you could give them some real quick situational awareness, verbal de-escalation, a quick primal gross motor stun and run move that allowed them to intercept the assault and get away without with minimal emotional psychological injury why would why would you want to deny them that ability and and quite literally that's how we teach self-defense we teach self-defense the way uh, a fireman would teach a cpr first aid course this is what you need to know this is how you're going to put on a tourniquet. This is how you're, you're, you're going to do CPR. Somebody needs to call 911 while you're doing this, right? And so yeah. it's, it's the same thing, you know? Uh, uh, and those to me are, are, are two of the clearest, most lucid metaphors that I can, get, that I can give people. But, and that's what we get are, are um, you know, high-ranking people online mocking our stuff. And I'm going, wow. You're a martial arts instructor, and I guarantee your your advertising says, you know, learn, study with us so you can learn self-defense and confidence, humility, and respect. 
and one day, one day I'm going to do a show where I just read hate emails and mean tweets and all of that. You can't believe the stuff that grown adults have, have written, male and female. You're a scam. You're a fraud. This is bullshit. Why don't you come to my school? Uh, you know, and these are like, like people with hundreds of them and going, wow, what a, what a role model, what a leader. And, and I, I only bring this up because if some of your listening listeners catch yourself feeling a little defiant, agitated, my, my hater, monetizing haters jokes and, and, but our system and all that, just be careful that you haven't accidentally consumed some of the Kool-Aid that, that we all do. Right. I did too. Right. It was, it was, it was what started my system. What jump started my system was, um, I didn't start off, even though my dream was always to, to do this. I didn't, I didn't start off one day going, Oh, I'm going to, um, open up a school now and start teaching. I was working for my father in a factory, getting paid $4 an hour in 1979. I didn't have a school. I didn't have like rich parents who said, you know, here's your dojo. You know, I was working in a factory, sweeping dirt from the floor, unpacking clothing. And one of my father's top customers comes in, this guy, Joey, and he had seen me um, punching and kicking some. We did these big boxes that came in from the Orient, and they were massive. And I was still training every day, but I would, I would, I would use the boxes. They were so thick, I would use them like heavy bags. So I'd be punching them and nailing them and kicking them. And he comes up to me. He says, uh, hey, my son, Mitchie, he's 15. He's having a bully issue at school. I want you to teach him how to do that. And I'm like, what? He says, I saw you doing like kicks and punches. He's like, I'm like, oh, okay. He goes, uh, do you teach? I said, well, no, but I'll, I mean, I can show him some stuff. And um, he says, how much will you charge me? I said, well, Joey, you're like a good friend of my dad's. I'm not going to charge you anything. He says, no, I want this to be separate. I want you to take this seriously. I said, I can't take your money. You know, I'll just, I'll just teach Mitch some stuff. He says, no. He says, I'm paying you. He says, I'll pay you at 20. How's that? So I'm thinking, he must mean for, you know, for five hours because I'm getting four bucks an hour. Right. And, uh, he goes, uh, I said, I said, okay, well, if I can't talk you out of it, that's fine. You know, we'll, we'll do that. He says, okay, so 20 bucks a lesson for one hour, once a week. And I'm like, I suddenly did the math in my head. I'm like, oh my God, right? <laughs> he's going to pay me $20. So I took this really, really seriously. And, and that's really how my business started. Um, I started teaching Mitchell and then Mitchell's brother wanted a lesson. And then the kid across the street wanted a lesson quite literally within a month. I had 30 students. I stayed working at my dad's and I would finish work at, at five between five and six and drive. And I would do privates for seven days a week for these 15, 16 and 17 year old kids. Now that might sound like, Oh, you're just teaching kids. Well, guess what? That's what most of the population is in martial arts schools. Um, and I was only 19 at the time. So there wasn't, it wasn't like I was 50 teaching 15 year olds going, you know, and they were my laboratory and they were all like athletic, um, you know, hockey players, skiers, football players. And I was experimenting with different things with them. Well, Mitch had this altercation with this kid and, and got punched out and lost the fight. And it was that moment that made me that was when I realized we teach self-defense wrong. Cause what I had been teaching him until then was everything I had been taught. And so I'm trying to get this full circle of, of drinking the Kool-Aid. And, and I don't mean that in, it's got a really derogatory connotation for many, but what I mean, if you don't know what it means, uh, you know, the way I interpret it for this is I'm, I've just, I just believe anything I'm told. So, you know, people would say, uh, like back in the day, I remember asking my, my instructor, what if the guy has a gun? And the answer, the default answer is what's in your pocket that's worth your life. If he has a gun, just cooperate with him. Give him, give him your property. And I used to, I taught that for years until I realized that the reason I was saying that was because I was just repeating what I've been told by my instructors and that I really didn't understand gun disarms. And I really understand that there are people who have been, um, moved to secondary crime scene at gunpoint and then tortured and murdered. And so that didn't have to do with your wallet or your purse. And then suddenly I felt disingenuous. As I did more research, I realized 
like that answer wasn't the answer. And the reason it was a safe answer is because I didn't know what the answer was. And that really bothered me. But people have to be that, that's your, your integrity, right? That's your and self-awareness. So, so anyhow, um, the kid I was teaching, his name was Mitchell. I come back for a private lesson. He's furious. He got punched out. I'd been training him for three months. Thought he would do well. What was I teaching him? I was teaching him privately every week, boxing, kickboxing, taekwondo, and wrestling. That's a pretty, pretty solid combo. It was a mixed martial art way before the UFC. We grappled, we clinched, because I blended everything that I, I had done. If you look at, there's a video I put out called Forging a Fighting System, and it's got clips of us from 1980. 1980, the fir very first video on this, uh, the fir very first clip on this video is we're wearing the Junri safety chops. My, f my first student from university, this guy Trace, he, we're good friends. He sucker punches me just after we tap gloves. And we're, you know, we're filming this thing on a tripod and he sucker punches me in, in the, in the funny humorous way, right? You're, you know, your buddy, you're going to work out and you're going to film it. We tap gloves and he just nails me right off the tap, like, like a ricochet, like a rock skipping in a pond. You know, I flinch and I cover, I whip back a, a short left hook, catch him in the face. He's not wearing a mouth guard. I put his teeth right through his lip. He fires back another punch as a wild flurry. I grab him, I, I take him down, and we're doing like on the concrete on my dad's driveway. I mean, this is like 13 years before the first UFC. That's how we fought all the time, you know? And so it was, it was everything. And, uh, and, and slowly adding more equipment as we injured ourselves more, right? Um, but the idea here is, is that from me as drinking the Kool-Aid going, well, this is, this is enough, but that wasn't a real fight. What that was, was that was violent sparring, but it wasn't a violent encounter. You tracking? Yeah. And, and so jump ahead now to 1990 uh, or 1980. Um, I'm teaching this kid, Mitch, and he goes to school. The bully trips him. He's running late for class. The bully trips him. Mitch loses his shit a little bit. He's muttering under his bath, breath, you know, uh, curses at the guy. The guy gets up, and this is the first time they've actually... You know, the guy was kind of bullying him, oppressing him. But this is the first time they're now getting physical. And uh, and Mitch goes, leave me, leave me the fuck alone, man. I, you know, I don't even know you. You've been bugging me since school started. And um, and uh, the guy goes, what are you going to do about it? And Mitch loses it. And he's picked up his books because the guy tripped him. He fell down. He picks up his books, grabs the kid by the lapel and slams him against the locker bank and says, just leave me alone, man. I don't want to fight. And... Uh, the kid sucker punches him, just drops him with a left hook. And Mitch explains this to me, and he's furious. And I go, well, why didn't you slip? Why didn't you check it? Why didn't you do all the stuff we do when we did the infighting? And he looks at me, Jeremy, and he goes, well, my left hand, I was holding him by a shirt. My right hand, I had my books in. And in that moment, like the God of War zapped me, I went, holy shit, we do not teach self-defense properly. Sparring isn't self-defense. Are there attributes you can develop? Pain management, range, distance, aerobic, anaerobic efficiency, learning how to not blink, mental toughness, combinant. Yeah, there's a ton of good attributes, but they're not going to prepare you for the emotional, psychological chaos of a violent encounter. The only thing you can do for that is to do that and to reverse engineer those scenarios. And they're out there for us. There's millions of examples of them. And there's commonalities in, in scenarios. And what I did right there intuitively, I was 20 years old. I looked at Mitchell and I said, I'm so sorry. And he said, what are you apologizing for? He said, man, I said, I didn't teach. I was furious with myself. Now, most instructors, and I've done this as a test a couple of times. I've, it, you know, in our trainer development course, I tell the story without the outcome and the conversion. And I go, uh, what did Mitchell do wrong? And most instructors, before I tell them what I, what I did, talk about all the flaws Mitchell did. He didn't keep his distance. He should have kept his hands free. He uh, shouldn't have done this. He should have been southpaw instead of, you know, like whatever the style bias was, they had a mechanical answer to why Mitchell lost that fight. And I go, no, 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 no. 
Mitchell lost that fight because we didn't do scenarios. Mitchell lost that fight because we didn't do verbal de-escalation. Mitchell lost that fight because he didn't understand stimulus, stimulus response, what happens before what happens. He lost the fight because all we did was spar to prepare him for self-defense, which means the only time you feel acclimated and comfortable is when the fight actually starts. That's the Star Trek model. Oh, now I know where we are. But until we get there, I don't know where we are. So it's like driving lost. You're still driving. You ever been lost driving? Of course. Or walking? It's uncomfortable. Sure. You have anxiety. Where am I going to be late? Shit. What if I'm, you know, and if you're lost in a scary area, right? I got lost in one of the shittiest parts of New Jersey once. I mean, I was, I, I got lost in downtown LA once I turned the wrong street and went down the street where like the cops don't even go down it. I drove 60 miles an hour down it through lights. It was this, it was like night of the living dead. It was the scariest shit. Total anxiety. It's like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Uh, and I told some cop friends that I actually didn't turn and I went, oh my God, dude, you know? And so um, the, the, what I want your listeners to connect to is that you can be lost when you're driving. You're still driving, but your palms are sweating and you're, you're not, you're, you got tunnel vision and you're looking around and you're worrying about shit and you're, you're looking, oh, I'm going to run out of gas and I'll be stuck here and I don't have my phone, whatever it is. You're thinking about a whole bunch of things. You're not now, you're not thinking about hands at, 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 uh, uh, you know, 10 and two or hands at, uh, you know, seven and five or, you know, however you drive and posture correct. You know, you're not relaxed driving, you're panic driving. I'm exaggerating to make the point, but I think the point is clear. But, but most people, when I tell them, what did Mitch do wrong? They give me a mechanical answer that's derived or extracted from their martial art encyclopedia. And I go, here's what I did with Mitchell. I had Mitchell grabbed me the way he grabbed the guy holding the books that he was holding and in slow motion we replicated stuff and started to look at all we started and worked backwards from the sucker punch what do you see what are the pre-contact cues what do you feel what are you visually tactile and now you know years later when we do the, the start of flinch block we talk about auditory visual and tactile the pre-contact cues that will trigger the cross extensive reflex so that when you when you invest a little time in there, what happens is you improve your perception speed, you decrease your reaction time. And understanding that now if you're holding something in your hands, again, deeper research leads us to understand that if you're holding something in your hands and your opponent makes you flinch, that you will clamp down and lock down on that. And therefore, if you think you might get into a physical confrontation with somebody, you need to clear your hands. But knowing that in advance only comes out of doing the research and the scenario training. And so what I didn't do is tell Mitchell that he should have been standing at kicking range. What I did is respect the fact that he was in school, in a school fight with his school books, and that I had failed him. And then we reverse engineered the stuff so that, God forbid, he was ever in that confrontation again, he would know better than to grab the person with his books in his hand. And it's not the same answer as, it's, it's completely different than somebody goes, well, isn't that what I said? He should have been standing further back with no books. No. Because there's no substance to that. That's suggesting that he wouldn't have his books to start with and that he could control the distance in a fight. A violent encounter always is inside close quarter range. Even if the guy comes running at you from 21 feet, when he goes to headbutt you or elbow you or stab you, he's in your close quarter range. Yeah. So, anyways. Wow. So there's a lot of this. So this yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's, this is, this is a really fun talk because you just go, let me like ramble. There's a lot of, you know, there, there's a lot to the tapestry that makes up, you know, the, the story of how we got to where we are. And I liked hearing it cause you know, I, I'm, I'm seeing all these distinct pieces that, that jump out and I'm wondering, you know, had you had these unique circumstances, would you have gone off and, and founded the things that you've you found and taught the people that you've taught in the way that you've taught them. And I'm going to guess no. You know, it I, seems kind of like this unique set agree. of circumstances. Yeah, I'm going to agree. I can, you know, that's one of the books I want to, I got to, I got to jump on. And people have been asking for it, for like hearing these stories because there are, and I started writing them down, you know, a couple of years ago, just there are, you know, those crucible, pivotal experiences that suddenly shape why you do things. And I've had uh, 
tremendous ones with with some very famous fighters and people and and you know you go oh wow that's a piece of the puzzle and um but uh you know I've, you know i've been fortunate in that way but i also look at it as you know i go back to this 15 year old kid who, who's lip syncing the key eye you know yeah i had the the um personal courage to go i think this is wrong and i'm I'm, you know but i know that i'm I'm just a kid so nobody's going to listen to me so i'm not going to be disruptive in class and i'm going to let everyone do it but i'm never going to yell before i hit somebody (laughs) then especially now that i know everything i know about startle flinch right that's just gonna that's going to make them more resilient and when i hit you i don't want you resilient i agree let it out so as we start to kind of wind down here, um, we have some other kind of more fun, yep. if I can use that word. Not that our conversation hasn't been fun and really enjoyable, but uh, lighter questions. Yep. Um, martial arts movies, you mentioned that you're you're a fan. Do you have any favorites? I'm a huge fan. Well, I love most of anything Jackie Chan does. Of course, Enter the Dragon is the classic. Um uh, you know, I love I love all of you know Bruce's movies because he's so iconic. Big, big fan of Tony Jaw, uh, especially mm-hmm. the first Ong Bak uh, or Ong Bak. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, uh, the, uh, the Have you seen any of the Raid movies? Mm, I think I saw the first one. The first one was insane. So like yeah. like that, you know the the apartment scene. <laughs> just you know and they're like all the fights in there are just insane so you know, it was one of those things where i saw it and i went oh my god you know and bought it right away and and uh you know wa- watch watch it every couple of months when i'm traveling i'll watch that for a good dose of creative violence um sure and you know i like i like a lot of the classics i mean just you know the the new wing chun movies yip man movies and oh, um so good. yeah, yeah. So, so and it is so it's interesting you know so like you know the people that go tony hates that now I dig all that shit, but you know, I um, I can appreciate, you know, I can I can watch a film of Barishnikov and appreciate how amazing a ballerina is, but I'm not. He's not going to beat me in a fight, you know. I understand he's a better athlete than me, and he's got better balance, and he can do things with his legs that Bill Superfoot Wallace can't do, right? But yeah. but it's uh, you know, you come back to what you asked me uh, a while back. I think I I really believe. That the uh, self defense package needs to be that just that it's a self defense package because you can't you can't spend years and years and years just practicing attempted you know kidnapping and how to counter this and attempted right you know you can if you're a trainer and you're making your community safe so that's what I've been doing for three decades but um, I I think that that the reason CrossFit's popular and Taekwondo is popular and Judo and Jiu Jitsu is because you're building community and family and, and you're working together and there's goals and belts and levels. And I think there's value in all that. And I think that there's, you know, I mean, I have a badass side kick and front kick and back kick, you know, you ever see Joe Rogan's, you know, kicks uh, online. He can, he can kick like a freaking mule and he's a black belt from Eddie Bravo, you know? Um, the, uh, uh, you know, can he handle himself in the street? You know, I don't, I don't know. You know, it's, you can, you can separate us. But what I'm, what I'm getting at here is this, is that my kicks, the foundation of my kicks are from studying Thai boxing and Taekwondo. But if I don't weather the ambush in the street, I can't get to my complex motor skill. It's a separate package. Right, so if you go, oh, well, you know, jujitsu is going to handle this, or MMA is going to handle this, or, you've got to weather the ambush um, to uh, to make that happen, and that's and that's just where we come in, and that's just that's a small package. So what I'm saying is, like, you can do this, right? Like, you can put the fire extinguisher in your house, in your office. You can learn about it and how to use it, learn about the scenarios, and run through some drills in your mind. But you don't need to become a fireman. You can still go to jujitsu school, but you put the fire extinguisher in the right place. And if you want to, now I have some people who are investigating ways to um, uh, blend this stuff, 
you know, and that might be an interesting future interview to have them on, you know, on a call to talk about how they've, I've got like some yeah. really high ranking Taekwondo people who travel the world, you know, international level all over the world. Uh, and they always bring in our personal defense readiness and spear into the courses they do. But, you know, what they're doing is trying to augment the safety of that particular association or federation. Um, so, you know, it's, um, you know, there are ways to do it. That's just, that's just not my core competency. And that's okay. Yep. I think there's something very martial art-ish about taking what you've learned and running with it and taking it in a whole different direction. I mean, I think a lot of the thing, a lot of martial artists, a lot of traditional martial artists forget that every single style out there was once new and was once developed out of the fusing, the fusion of other styles. Right. There's, there's nothing that, you know, originated from God to say, you know, what? this, you know, Goju is a style that shall remain pure for eternity. You know, it's, it's, so when I see someone that has taken martial arts, taken it in a direction, and it works for them and for other people, I think that's beautiful. And I think that that's ultimately what has happened. Every, everything out there was tested at some point by other people. I mean, you know, we've, we've all seen martial arts schools, system styles pop up that were junk. Yeah. And they didn't stand those tests, and they fell away quickly. The reason a lot of these traditional arts are out there is because for the goals that were set out for them, right? And and we've talked a lot about on this show about the difference between self-defense and a martial art. We did a whole show where we defined what a martial art was. And you and I keyed in on the, on the same word, the fact that art, art is the noun in that term. Right. Martial is, is an adjective. It's a modifier at its core. Martial arts are in artistic pursuit. Right. So, you know, Shotokan, Taekwondo, Muay Thai, whatever they are, they are not first and foremost combat disciplines. There's combat in there. There's some great stuff in there. There's some stuff that's going to apply. And you talked a lot about that. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tie together some of the things that you've said because I don't want anybody out there, you know, taking what you said in, in chunks. I mean, you, you, you spoke in depth about a lot of things and if someone took, you know, 10 minutes here or 10 minutes there, it would be easy to, I think, to gloss over the unison that you had for all these things. It's and, and fine. It's a, it, says, it says everything about them, nothing about us. So if they, <laughs> if they do it, it's, it's, uh, it, it is what it is. It is. All right. Well, you know, I don't, I don't know what more there else is to say. I mean, normally at this point we say, would would you be willing to offer some advice for everyone listening? I don't know, maybe, maybe you've woven that in, but is there, is there a nugget of wisdom you want to go out on? Um, I, I would just uh, encourage people to do their research and make up their mind for themselves and just step away and be objective and, and uh, just maybe listen to it, listen to this interview if you found yourself, if you found yourself nodding and making notes and googling shit and looking at stuff, then cool, right? Um, if you found yourself a little agitated, defensive, right? Then, um, then I would encourage you to you know take a break from this and come back to it. it was a long, long talk. Is uh, come back and and listen to it again and 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 really start from the place of if you. For a moment, just assume that I'm completely sincere when I say I want you to be safer. I don't care what style you, you practice or study or love. If you call me up and you go, uh, hey, somebody tried to attack me and I did this friggin', uh, I ran up the wall and I did this backflip move I saw Jackie Chan did and I landed on the person's shoulder and did this like monkey kung fu drop on their head that I saw in a Shaw Brothers film and then I you know, did this and did that and I got away, I'm going to be happy for you. I'm going to, you know, if you go, and, but if you do it in a sneering way, you go, you see, you said that wouldn't work. I go, yeah, man, seriously, you don't think you were a little bit lucky with that? Like, like, what if there's not a wall there next time? Or what if the guy is like too short or too tall? Or what if he's wearing a motorcycle helmet? And, you know, and it's, it's, it's a funny argument when, when, when people like send you that or tag you in that video going, look, 
see here, jujitsu, see here, taekwondo. And I go, no, that's a consensual fight. That's not a violent encounter. Although they're really fighting, it's not the same as a real fight. And there's that selective listening thing again. So the only thing I would do is like, is like, hey, you know, uh, uh, some, some people aren't ready to listen to this and some people are. And let's, let's hope there's more people that are. Uh, it's, I, don't, I don't need people to sign up and do stuff. I'm trying to make people safer. It's not like I'm trying to sign you up for like a life, lifetime membership and, you know, it's like, hey, go do a four-hour class for a hundred bucks. Go do a one-day class for 150 bucks. And, you know, if it's bullshit and you're not safer, then you blew 150 bucks. You know, it's, you know, but it's not bullshit. We wouldn't be in business 30 years and go check us out. That's probably the place to start. Um, go to blowerspear.com. And look at the testimonials. Go to our testimonial page, you know, and, and look at them. They're not the John L. said this, you know, Bob Q's. They're actual names of people and read how deep they are and, uh, and read some of the articles. And, and just remember the fact that, that uh, you know, what, what we're doing is, is all, has all been reverse engineered, just like, just like we started out with a, kind of the caveman metaphor. You know, this is serendipity. It's not, I didn't, you know, I, you know, I wasn't trying to build a, you know, a better iPhone and trying to come up with something. That's all. I'll leave I got. it right there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, Perfect. you know, I mean, if you got a lot of trainers on here, I mean, that's our, our, that's our core business, man. We're trying to make the world safer. So, uh, I don't, I don't know when this is going to get released or how fast it gets, it gets put out. You know, we've got our annual combatives camp in Vegas, um, I wish you lived closer because you could you could whip to it, but hop on a Southwest flight to Vegas, August sixth <laughs> and seventh. Um, but uh, you know, come do like a like a camp. Our camp's one hundred and fifty bucks for the weekend. So experience me and my trainers and go, wow, is this a community that I'd want to be, you know, uh, part of? Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the other stuff out there <clears throat> I see, and it's got this kind of like weird, culty militia kind of energy to it and i'm like nope you know that's we just hang out and uh and have fun and and our our team has fun and and we just try to make people safer thank you for listening to part two of episode 108 and thank you to mr blower over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com you can find links and photos to a lot of mr blower's materials his social media websites and seminars if you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. And our username is Whistlekick. If you like the show, please be sure you're subscribing and using one of our free apps. They're available on both iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, Remember, we randomly check out the different podcast review sites, and if we find yours and mention it on the air, like we did today, be sure to email us for your free pack of Whistlekick stuff, including a t-shirt and some other great things. Remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com or on Amazon, like our sparring boots. If you're a school owner or team coach, you should check out wholesale.whistlekick.com for our discounted wholesale program. We'll be back before you know it, but until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.